welcome to the Sweeney versus Bard podcast, which is now an organ of our new body platform called Parallax. I'm here with the badasses of the badasses when it comes to philosophers. The Zoroastrian genius Alexander Bard and my favorite Nietzschean hammer Thomas Helmerich. Parallax is a platform for fearless and prophetic thinking. We are doing a lot of cool stuff these days, like a live lecture series with Q&A, a new podcast, a new YouTube channel, and a lot of interviews and great articles. So if you would like to help out at Parallax, please subscribe on YouTube, sign up for a podcast, check out our website, become a member of our Patreon site, donate if you feel moved to. So a topic I want to bring up today, because we discussed it before, when we discussed the models of lynch mobs, and of course, Girard's fantastic work on lynch mobs and how, how, how they are generated, since that is very much a contemporary problem. Um, pagan lynch mobs, we should say. I mean, I think we all agree that once you drop out of, for example, an eventological religion like Christianity and think you're getting over it, actually you're just falling back into paganism. And that's, that's obvious, I think, in contemporary society. And against lynch mobs, we then put the sort of more messianic idea of the exodus, like, Okay, so you don't, if you don't like it, if, if the world doesn't go with the times and, and develop with the technologies you got around you and people are just too much of Luddites and you know, too conservative around you, you basically get your friends together and leave for somewhere else, either for a new period in history or maybe even a new territory. And these exoduses, I would say, are then the opposites of the lynch mobs, historically speaking. And that's why they're interesting. And, and of course, we have explored together which I'm working on for my new book with John Sadekis, the process and event book that we're writing at the moment. We're working on this idea that out of the lynch mobs comes the voice of the anaject. And out of the desire for the exodus comes the voice that we call the hyperject. The hyperject is, of course, Nietzsche's overman. It could also be seen as Marx's proletarian. You know, it's somebody who's heroic and steps into the new. But the anaject is really interesting here since the anaject is just this sort of assumption that we all agree within the lynch mob. We're gonna kill this sort of innocent scapegoat, get the tension out of the system. But there's a voice inside of us to sort of, you know, um, ratify so that the killing of the abject is okay. And this voice will then step forward and put it on a costume on that voice and you got the tyrant. So we explore that. The model is fantastic, makes a lot of sense. I can build an entire exodology of John Sertikis based on this and also co-credit you guys. But the problem is that the sexual ritual or sexuality is not properly mapped. Where does that come into the picture? And this is, we've dealt with this before, that yeah. the Dionysian with the Nietzsche is also very confusing. And we'll be discussing before that maybe the mistake or, or what's lacking in Nietzsche's concept of the Dionysian is that there isn't an understanding of a constructive Dionysian mob and a destructive Dionysian mob. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a really interesting topic I would like to explore with you guys, because I think the mistake we're making is that we don't understand sexuality as the reward for adult human behavior. As a reward. And the reward comes at the end of the timeline. It doesn't come at the beginning. It comes at the end, right? It's, it's very often nighttime. I would expect sexual rituals to be like, you know, eight, nine, 10 o'clock in the tropics or something like that. That's when you would perform your sexual rituals. Certainly not during the daytime. Wouldn't make much sense because you got to make sure you survive, first of all. And if you just if you just take it in a very simple way, you just look at women and the way women perceive men as sexual objects. <laughs> there's this saying that actually there's a lot of truth to it, that women first think of a dog, having a dog, and behind that possibly having a baby instead. And then they will think of shoes, and behind that possibly having some fashion, you know, getting dressed and looking mm -hmm. great and all that. Mm -hmm. And then third, they would think of sex, meaning that you basically teach men that a woman will think of her dog and will think of her shoes first, and then she might consider you. And you will never, there's no way for you to get beyond her, her attraction towards the dogs and the shoes. You can't compete with that. So if yeah. women think of dogs and shoes first and then think of having sex, obviously they think of a lot more than dogs and shoes before they think of having the sex, but it just emphasizes that for men as well, there are other things we do before that. And this is where I go into what I call my critique of Taoism. Mm -hmm. You know, I love Zoroastrianism and I certainly admire Buddhism with you guys, especially the Vajrayana version. My problem though with Chinese philosophy is that Chinese philosophy never really manages to get out of the eternal return of the saint. It's really hard for the Chinese to understand that the event can make a radical break in history. Mm -hmm. 
it's not Chinese philosophy, like Indian philosophy, deals with that they're so focused on nomadology, so focused on eternal return of the same. For example, we all know the Chinese find it very hard to understand that it can be something original. <laughs> they copy bad or they copy well, but there could be something original, something you do is hard to understand within the Chinese cultural context. And my critique of Taoism is essentially this one. Long before we can even afford to look at yin and yang as the major opposites, mm -hmm. I, I think yin and yang as major opposites could only develop in a sort of deranged, uh, permanently settled culture. Because it's kind of a luxury to think of masculine and the feminine as the original division. So I would like to look at division as something that could be something that only happens on the feminine or the masculine side first. It makes little sense to the other side. And I think the provocative thesis here is that division is something that men need, but women can afford to ignore. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Again, I, I, I've been studying all this uh, alchemy stuff recently, and uh, the traditional symbol of, of uh, you know, mask of the feminine is the, the moon, right? It, I mean, it's usually lunar and masculine is solar. But in this system, man is the reflecting. It's, it's the moon. It's the reflecting. So it's the divided part. And the sun, the solar is actually the, the feminine because it's already complete. So men are sort of incomplete and women are, are complete. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and there's, so there's a triad here. There's not just man and female being these equal parts that fit together. There's, there's, there's this, um, you know, there's this, there's, this, uh, there's this division in man or something like that. Does that make well, any sense? In a very fundamental way, that means that the sun and rain divide among men the division between the sun god and the rain god that for example later becomes the father and the son division in christianity just an example uh that division is primordial and then occurs before you can think of sun and moon because for the moon of the feminine the division isn't that important mm -hmm. yeah so for women would then automatically be way more embodied with mm -hmm. mind body being more embodied than men are and men struggle with that because mm -hmm. men have different purposes with their life compared to women. Yeah. What and this the, means the is, the women yeah, is so that means the, that we shouldn't look for the division between men and women as primordial because we can actually afford to put, put that back. So we get sexuality into its right place. And what's interesting when you start looking at that way is that the first division would then between, be, be the one between mind and body among men, meaning you look for a guy, a thin, skinny little guy who has a really bright mind and can figure things out. And he's the, he becomes the priest eventually. And you separate the priest, like Zoroaster's do, you separate the priest vehemently from the king or the chieftain, if you like that. The king character or the chieftain character, we could say, is then the other guy and he's the rain god. He's the fertilizer. He's the will to transcendence, whereas the priest is the will to intelligence. This is also where we separate Nietzsche's will to power because it has to be split in two. It's not a will to power like abstract power or something like that because the end they, who wants power anyway he's boring and tiresome to be honest about it no the, you you either want a will to intelligence which is you gather all of history up until now and then you deliver the Nietzsche and Amor Fati. do you accept the fact that this is our understanding of everything that happened until now which is what the priest challenges you to do and once you're done with that with the priest you what you do at the confession booth for example you, you walk out of there by accepting fate up until now then you walk out in the world and you do the novel, you do the new, you transcend, you, you think of your heritage, you think of your sons, you think of your children, you think of the world after you've died. All those things are, are the concerns, the will to transcend us, that we then think of the royal phallus, whereas the first one is the priestly phallus, the royal phallus is this. And I think this is the fundamental Zoroastrian understanding of a division between the Oda and Masta. And it's more primordial than Taoism's division of yin and yang. And even that, even after that, we could even allow it to play. So, like, if that is the case, and you got a long day before you go into the sexual division between man and woman, which happens in the evening or night, then you also got the separation between the war and the hunt. And the war and the hunt, that means you got four characters in here. When you go to war, you got the war chieftain and the war priest. When you go to the hunt, you got the hunt chieftain and the hunt priest. But hunting and warfare are very different things because in hunting, you kill animals. When you go to war, you kill humans, you murder. So mm -hmm. this is the difference between murder and killing.
And I think it's really interesting to look at it that way because that split is then it gives it a quadrant. This might sound a bit complex, but actually it's it's, it's way we're still making it. We simplify it a lot. We, we could think of it as much more complex than that, but it allows us to do the work during the day, make the effort. So a man has meaning and purpose in his life because he's got to go through these two, at least these two stages before it arrives in the evening and then sexuality arrives as a reward. Now, what's interesting with this idea is that if you've got the kind of culture we have today with pacifism and veganism as dominant modes, and they've gone in and out of fashion for the past three or 4,000 years. And they always tend to be a sign of upcoming chaos and havoc, as Thomas usually says, the apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because pacifism attacks the idea of war, warfare and claims war is, is a bad thing or redundant and it's no longer needed. And it also, through veganism, claims the hunt is no longer needed, no animals should ever be killed because killing anything is evil, et cetera, et cetera. So you get animal rights and things like that. The clear examples of a culture that is falling apart, right? So whenever you see pacifism and veganism, you would expect over-sexualization to become a major problem. You would start a jerk off at nine o'clock in the morning. Your sexuality loses its position as, as the ultimate reward before you go into the night and then the next day comes along and you remove it completely. So the yin and the yang eats the whole. It eats up everything, masculine versus feminine. Sexuality eats up everything because you actually, you actually removed the very things ahead of it that actually should be prior to it. Mm -hmm. Does Thomas, this make sense to you guys? I, I, I think you're, you're basically talking about, um, you're talking about sex and violence essentially, right? Yes, and, violence and, prior to sex, exactly, you got I, it. I, totally, I think that's a very good point because uh, people nowadays seem to be, uh, they, they seem to be very obsessed with sexuality and sexuality seems to be the central problem and everybody's talking mm -hmm. about sexuality and, and problems related to society and sexuality. But the, the only reason that you can do that is because the problem of violence to, to a great extent in the Western world has been solved. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't no. be worried about, about sexuality, you would be worried about getting killed There's or some about killing others. There's a bit of a difference in what you're saying, and I think you're saying a more Girardian thing, uh, uh, Thomas. And, and, you're, well, and, and Alexander's that, almost that saying that that we we need to return to violence or something. Or like, I'm not quite getting that. Well, okay. So Byung Byung Shul Han's uh, understanding of this is that the violence is as constant as sexuality. So if mm -hmm. violence has disappeared yeah. okay. from our society, we sort of swept it under the roof, uh, uh, under the carpet somewhere. Uh, it's no longer open, then it becomes passive, yeah. and then it becomes internalized. And yeah. that's why Jung Shulhan, in the tradition of Foucault, very adamantly talks about contemporary society as a society of self-exploitation. And what he means to self-exploitation is that the violence has been internalized, yeah. the police is now inside of us, and it, it, the, the relationship between the superego and the ego have gone completely bonkers. Well, and I would say that's quite obvious. I think we can recite this. Exactly and Marshall like says like, you know, dialogue is violence. Any, any kind of sport is violence. Um, you know, uh, politics is violence. All these things are, are, are sort of the way that society controls violence. But that's, yeah, but I, I think that, war, yeah, I think, but I, yeah. I mean, war is, is like, um, how do we yeah, some, more wait a second? Wait, 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 back off a little because yeah. the antagonic side of things we actually need to keep. And I, I we care. This is the problem. Violence is an abstraction. I'd love to hear Thomas's definition of it because he's obviously studied Girard a lot and he uses the term violence a lot. But but Byung Shulhan says that if we assume that sexuality is constantly there as a constant libido versus mortido force, then we must assume that violence is constantly there as a constant libido mortido force. And that means that we should not. If it looks like it's been swept away, it's probably just been internalized instead. Mm -hmm. So it comes back to haunt us individually. And also the fact that people have, you know, kind of video game weapons these days. It's like they're not, they're not, they're not fighting with, air, you know, with swords, and they're not wrestling with each other. And, you know, there's not this. There's no physicality to the kind of violence that the military engages in. You know, on in, in a large scale. So. So what do people do with that? Oh, computer games are definitely eerie in the sense that you're, you symbolically do something where you use your senses to do something you're programmed to actually experience is very real. But the problem is that even if you do martial arts instead of going to war, 
uh, you know, for example, you, you, you will be, it, that will also be eerie, although it takes a lot longer before it gets eerie and you realize this is not actual war. I'm not really murdering, you know, strangers or anything like that at all. I'm actually just fighting people in the ring. And it's a sport that pretends to be something it's not. So are you saying we need to go back to actual war? Like, No, but I'm saying we, we need to start realizing that violence is a constant here and sweeping it away and certainly sweeping it under the carpet and, and saying it uh -huh. must not exist. Yeah. Just means it's coming back to haunt us 10 times over, internalized instead. That is Byung Shul Han's argument, and I, I think I agree with him. And Byung Shul mm -hmm. Han, as you probably know, is very close to Rene Girard in his thinking. Yeah. These guys. I, I, I don't it. know him. I've never read him. Okay. He's, he's the Korean, Korean philosopher. He lives in Germany, but he's a Korean philosopher. And he takes a Korean Sion monk tradition, which is, of course, the same as Zen in Japan. And mixes it, uh, he did his, I think he did his dissipation on Catholicism in Germany. So he understands the West. He's, he's one of these Eastern guys who's gone to the West to really, really understand the West. A bit like Osho, for, I would say. But he takes a very sort of serious Korean Sion critical attitude. And it's not the sort of nagging postmodernist attitude at all. Why it's so refreshing to study Byung Shul Han. I think, I know John Favarkin loves him, is that Byung Shul Han. Uh, it's a refreshing voice from the East to understand the West and contemporary yeah. society. And he's a masterful essayist. Like he writes these yeah. incredible He's essays. written two books that are called The Burnout Society and The Transparency Society. He's obviously very critical of transparency as principle. And he says that you're just going to be completely exhausted by this constant, you know, uh, strive towards transparency towards everybody, which is again yeah. what we talk about. When we say the bar absolute. Get yourself a private life and isolate yourself from the public. That's the, that's number one recommendation in 2020. Mm -hmm. So, 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 do, so uh, I want to hear Thomas talk more about this like obsession with sexuality because there was a heated argument which I keep thinking about between you and Cattle about that, and and uh, and your critique was that he's 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 obsessed with sexuality. Um, that, that uh, sexuality is a kind of a simple thing that, you know, that, that we're over complexifying here. And whereas the real issue, the real human issue that everybody is kind of ignoring that is the most actually important issue is, is, is violence and the scapegoat and, and all that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that discussion. I, I think that, that, uh, so I, I was, I mean, I was in contact with Cadell a bit more and I, I think, uh, I think his, his, uh, viewpoint is, is a bit, uh, a bit more complex than, than I uh, accused him of. But but anyway, let hmm. let me uh, let me just make the point that, that I was trying to make then, and um, so so what we're trying to do here, what Alexander is trying to do, is is to basically understand humans not in terms of some blank slate, but in terms of of some really old patterns that are underlying our behavior, patterns that we are not aware of it, hmm. and and this is basically what what Freud tried to do, and and Jung, and also Girard, and and then. And if you if you start understanding what how people are basically working in a in a very fundamental way, then a lot of, of, of absurd behavior becomes becomes clear. And and one of the things that, that is, is very important is to understand that a lot of the stuff that we do, for example, our religions and our habits and our culture. So one of the main purposes of, of that, that kind of technology is to keep us from killing each other. That's the main problem that humans face. How can we not kill each other? That's the main problem. Sexuality is very important because sexuality leads to jealousy and envy. And people kill each other because of jealousy and envy. That's why every religion is very concerned with sexuality. But it's... So sexuality is the root of violence in, a, in some sense. No, 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 no. That's the whole no. point. It's, not, it's one, of the reason, one of the ways in which violence can escalate in a society. Is and it only think, one of the ways, or is it is it like the most primordial way? Like like somehow I, I, I somehow I have the, the intuition that it, it stems from that. No, okay, but if you just look no, at the people tribe, go, if, people yeah. go go and the, the people. I mean, like the first world war and stuff like that. I mean, you you have huge uh -huh. wars that break out because of prestige between between countries. People go to war because of nothing. Yeah. For absolutely or because not. of envy, I guess you would say there's a kind of like there's an envious thing. No, 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 no. Wait a second. Wait a second. Not, 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 I think what Thomas is trying to say is if you go back to the sociant, which I always refer to the original tribe, mm -hmm. it was constantly on the move. Fighting other tribes was absolutely necessary. And this is what we did for hundreds of thousands of years. 
Mm-hmm. You, yeah. you would kill people all the time. You can still yeah. go to New Guinea sure, to sure, think sure. Kill, no, no, no. killing some of another tribe is just a thing you so do. So sexuality like, was just one way reason why yeah. you would kill so somebody. So that okay. worked. That worked. And I'm not talking about this in some kind of Rousseauian, romanticist idea that this was a good life, whatever you need to go back to. It just, it's just to explain why we operate the way we do and what kind of forces we're dealing with here. It's like Thomas said, this is what Freud and Jung and the anthropologists yeah, yeah. are all you dealing with. That. That's what I'm interested in. So in the sociant, you would kill anybody who came from another tribe if you had access to it, because otherwise they would kill you. If they had a different painting on your forehead, you'd kill them. Because there were never more than 3 million people in total on the entire planet ever while we were nomadic. It was impossible to have any larger population than that because you didn't grow or produce any food anywhere. You had to go hunting for or gathering everything you'd eat. So you'd kill anybody else. So it was absolutely normal to get up in the morning and have a priest standing in front of you saying, we're gonna go and kill today. Mm-hmm. And if we're lucky enough not to have anybody to kill, we can hunt instead. And then we can have a feast tonight well, because well, otherwise we kill. So not only go, that, it's the sacrifices, the human sacrifices that took place. Yeah, but that's later. That's, I'm that's, not sure that is sociant. Are you sure that's later? That's yes, no, no, no. No, just because you read no, that in your book doesn't mean it's <laughs> anything I'm saying. It's, it's not later, though. I don't think it's right, Let me finish, please. Okay. We always get to this point. It's like. Yeah, because you are throwing two different narratives into the same mix. And I want to avoid that. In the Sassian, that means if you told people, if you told the guys, you got to get out there and either fight a war or go out and do the hunt. And when you come back and deliver and prove you've either expanded the territory, you won the war, or you come back with abundance, you hunted successfully, then the girls will have picked the berries to spice it all up and have a nice meal and a sexual ritual. Mm-hmm. That is why violence is prior to sex. That makes perfect sense. You don't have a problem there where you're going to, where, where the pressure cooker is going to be in such a system. Okay. Because you just put the pressure back into fighting and killing an animal or, or an enemy the next day. Now, we can't do that any longer in a sophisticated world with permanent settlements everywhere in the kind of urban and digital environments we have today and 8 billion people on the planet. Thomas is right. We can't mm-hmm. kill each other the way we used to. Now, we still have, we have to deal with the same forces inside of us because we have not changed. Yeah. So the question is, how do we deal with violence and sex? And the pointer is that if we don't understand violence first, and how to deal with the pressure cooker we're walking around yeah. with inside of ourselves and within our communities, then we're gonna fuck up sex completely. That's Way clear. More that, that's that's clear. Yeah. I, I, I get that. That's totally clear. The difference here is I think that Gerard argues that that starts right at the beginning. Like, how do we deal with with this pressure cooker? And the way we do that is human sacrifice and killing virgins and rape. You know, uh, creating a scapegoat. That's what Gerard argues. Whether it's 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 true or not. That's Gerard's argument, you know. So, uh, so uh, uh, you're well, arguing that that comes later when civilization gets the frustrated. And it's human. We can no longer do that. And what's that? Well, he actually. So his point is that it's what made us human. Right. And when we started doing that, then we start. That's when we became human. When we started copying each other, and we when we started slaughtering people to relieve the tension in the community. So this is this is what Gerard claims, and that is it's it's necessary for any community. If at least a pagan community to regularly have these these uh, liminal spaces where normal rules do not apply anymore and where you kill people to relieve the tension in the community, and that's basically that's how human tribes survived. The 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 humans who did not use this mechanism, this this very cruel and very pagan mechanism, they didn't survive. And he even even points to the origin of language, like the first word that was ever uttered. That was. The designation of the scapegoat. Let's kill that one because everybody hates that guy, and we're gonna kill him. Oh yeah, I mean, so that's why chicken kill, kill each other plant. too. I mean, it, it's it, there are other animals that do it too. So it's obviously even older than human. Yeah, it's very old. So this is very. Yeah. This lies at the, at the at the heart of the of the beginning of humanity, basically. And these these uh, these mechanisms are in us. And, and for example, you can remove a violent ritual as we have done in the West, but then what is going to happen with all this pent up aggression that, that, that is running rampant in, the, in society, especially if you have done, uh, we used to have Christianity to, to some extent. So we need also. religion for that, right? Yeah, you need religion for that. So now we're basically removing religion. We don't have pagan religion anymore, which would mean let's do a nice ritual and kill somebody so that we can get rid of our internal tension. Then we had Christianity that says, well, you know, these pagan rituals, they're pretty nasty. You know, there's something else, you know, love your neighbor and the other cheek and stuff like that. But we also chucked that out 
but now there's nothing left. So now we're faced with our, with our, with our basically our very primitive nature, and it's not held in check neither by pagan ritual nor by Christianity. We, so, we end up in a kind of pagan anarchy. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah, we're, and then of course you go back to paganism, but it's actually actually it's not even paganism because paganism mm -hmm. has a logic to it. You know, it, it actually you, you can order a society based on pagan principles. The Romans it's not nihilism, it basically. It's Nietzsche. It works. It, it's pretty right? nasty. I mean, you have you know yeah. you have the the Circus Maximus, and you have a, you know you know people be getting crucified and stuff like that. Very brutal, but it works. But now we chucked out paganism. We chucked out Christianity. Now we have nothing to organize our, our society anymore. Well, we, we still have our justice system, but the question is, is that enough, especially in an internet, uh, in, in an, uh, in an uh, interconnected world, like, like uh, the world we have now. And so there are a lot of pagan, very old um, patterns that are now emerging in our hyper-connected world. And I think that's what Alexander is talking about. So we need to look at and understand what are our primitive uh, drives what are our primitive modes of behavior that we will revert to if they are not streamlined by some kind of religion. So how do we streamline it? Are you suggesting we go back to Christianity or 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 not? I mean, oh no, no, wait, 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 wait. Like, you're, jumping we... to, you're jumping to the solution way too quickly, Andrew. Here we have to look at the problem first more deeper. All right. So yes. what we have currently, because it's a paradigm shift, and we're leaving the industrial age, moving into digital. Mm -hmm. is that at all paradigm shifts, we have the exposure of the old elite. The old elite is looking increasingly weak and desperate. So what we have is an elite that's being exposed for its corruption and the manipulation it's trying to do. So the corruption of money, the manipulation of politics, essentially. Well, for example, they try now to control big tech and big tech has fallen for it. I think big tech is doomed. It's going to be the one big mistake of digital is that big tech did not get digital at all. Digital will be something mm -hmm. radically different than what Silicon Valley expects it to be. So we're seeing these elites, both the so-called new elites, which is big tech, they don't get what they're doing, and the old elites falling apart. What we then have is a pagan lynch mob that doesn't even know which scapegoat is going to try to find to get the tension out of the system. All it does, it goes after all these old institutions that are, that are trying to attack people with terms like fake news, for example. And this is the chaos moving into right now. It's a very leaderless world. There's no yeah. leadership in this world. And that's why in our previous book, Digital Libido, we discussed this. It's a very dark book. And said that we got to watch out because it's very likely that the false messiahs or the fake phalluses will basically now step forward in history and we'll see them everywhere. And they come up with all kinds of ideas. And we got exposed to them for it while we're waiting for possibly the authentic phallus or the messianic to come along that can get us out of this morass that we're stuck with. Right. So yeah. th this is this is the this is the picture. You can't jump to quick solutions to it that sound no, good. Well, That's exactly what so many Americans are doing. And I completely resent that. No, this is not going to be easy at all. And we have no guarantees that we can solve the current problems. Yeah. There are no such yeah. guarantees. Well, I, I was I was always curious about i heard the sufis say that you know if you don't pray or do you know do you know the, do the sufi thing right then war is inevitable they, they didn't say like um they didn't say you should be a good person and not do this and this and this or or you're going to cause war it's like if you don't do if you don't make a sacrifice and the sacrifice would be a spiritual practice like you're you're giving up your life energy uh uh uh, uh, uh to like you you would say to god if you were a sufi but but there's some kind yeah, of sacrifice yeah, but, yeah. being made, and if you don't do that, then war war kind of just happens because you're you go. But back Andrew, to the this, is my, war, this, this is my this is my this is my critique mm -hmm. of John Favarke when he goes to Paul Tillich and all that stuff. All these guys are getting way too individual in their approach to the current crisis, mm -hmm. when actually it was individualism the goddess here. Mm -hmm. My critique that I'm building for the new book is that Christianity and Islam are not good enough to return to. Yeah. They were pop religions to begin with. Any religion that promised you're going to go to heaven when you die is ridiculous, right? And my problem with Christianity and Islam is that they, 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 were, they were perfect to be popular. They were widespread. They were kind of the precursors of the problem we've got with American pop culture today. It promises you everything as long as you buy it, right? And, and we ended, religion goes down the drain once technology has gone up. So basically yeah. 10,000 years technology has improved. It's the only improvement we've seen. Religion has gone downwards. And that's why I'm celebrating Zoroastrianism and, and the Vajrayana mm -hmm. Buddhism and, and, and Judaism yeah. in the new book, because these religions have a barred absolute installed into them. There's absolutely no way that man can have access to God. He'd probably bore to death if we talked to him. 
And, and, and this is why you need to go to the priest to have them talk to the gods on your behalf, at least. And okay. there's no guarantee you're going to survive after you die. Probably you'll die, die peacefully at best because you lived a good life and somebody will inherit what you but, achieved. But, but I'm agreed. I'm agreed with that. But I think Thomas has a disagreement here. I think, I, I think, well, no, I don't, I don't know. Do well, you or not? I, like, I want, let's get this clear. No, well, well I, I think that every religion has a pop side. Every religion has these aspects that don't really make much, much sense. They're kind of like, you know, they're things that were attached to, to the core that did make sense. So, um, I mean, also, you, you can see that these religions that have survived for such a long time, they did a good job of keeping people alive. So there must be some kind of core that actually worked. Like in Christianity, Christianity for example, is fantastic with the exposure of the of the scapegoat mechanism. I mean, there's no, there, I don't know of any religion that is better at pointing out the the the, the inherent problem with, with mob killing scapegoats. I mean, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Buddhism is brilliant in its own way. Um, and it also has its pop problems, right? I mean, in the in the Second World War, there were there were plenty of kamikazes who were uh, inspired by Buddhism to give their lives, right? Yeah, so, but uh, so Thomas, this sounds like somebody defending all political positions, saying that socialism, liberalism, conservatism are equally good all the time. Let's dare to compare religions here. Well, I, 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 I only know two religions. Which ones well, could actually hold up? And both pretty good. I mean, no, I think the cool. pop religions are dead. I think they are not to be returned to. That's exactly what we left Christianity. I think Nietzsche's critique of the death of God is the death of the Protestant Christian God forever. There's no way back. We can learn from Christianity and history. We can learn from paganism. We can learn from all these stories. We can, we can learn from the Babylonian stories too. Yeah, there, there the is question no now is, the, is, is where we're stuck historically. There is we no left Christianity. Get over it. There's, it's, no there's no way back. Christianity has always been a process, just like Buddhism is a process, Islam is a process. You cannot talk about, about a religion as some kind of fixed thing that is right or wrong. It doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. I'll explain I why. Don't think so. No, I think the problem is Gnosticism. And it's been the problem with the West since about the third century. Okay? Although it existed during the Axial Age too. I think during the Bronze Age when stuff was built, was a much more interesting period for us to look back to today than the Axial Age. It was a full of pillar saints that declared all these different ideas, religious and spiritual ideas they had and walked around being high on their own fucking egos. And the problem is that they separated mind and body. And they either went for mind without body, which is the classical Gnostic, the Manichaeans and the Mastakites of the world. That's exactly the problem with communism. That's exactly. And then you got the other one, which is body without mind. We will arrive at the problem with fascism, which is the celebration of body and just like, don't think at all, just act, right? Aesthetic politics like fascism and Nazism, but definitely, you know, the other kind. What they all did was that they completely neglected the important collaboration between the priest and the chieftain. So they either go for the rain god and kill the sun god, or they go for the sun god and kill the rain god. Christianity tried to keep the two by keeping them father and son, and then having the spirit as the kind of female thing you're responsible to that can then materialize into the congregation. That's the great thing with Christianity. It tried to do that. I think the Trinity is genius in Christianity, but the problem is that the Gnosticism that's still inherent to Christianity, even more so to Islam. Gnosticism is fundamental to Islam. That's why it's a weak religion today. That's just exploding in all these sort of fundamentalist blood orgies and attacks on anybody who disagrees with it. It's a weak religion. It's got all the signs of weak religion because it attacks and throws bombs at you when you disagree with anything. Yeah, I mean, a religion that can't stand you burn. It's the biggest. religion that can't stand you, you burn the printed copies of its book. It's a weak religion. It's weak. Okay, so it's blowing up. Christian and Islamic fundamentalism is blowing up in the faces of us right now with Americans and Arabs going for those two alternatives. That just shows to me they're over. They, they're, not, they're not the proper response to where we're stuck. I, I don't know if religions ever are over. They just continue on and on and on, don't they? The process I, is no, no, no. They get popular, yes. But I mean, the they might be getting worse or better, but they, 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 I mean, there are problems with Christianity and Islam. I'm not denying that, but no, I think, I think, I think, the, Andrew, the religions that we need to look for right now are the ones that didn't proselytize and send missionaries everywhere and clubbed you on your head if you didn't fall into it. These are the, the only religions oh, we agree, can but... trust today, seriously, are the, the spiritual schools that actually invited you to a really serious conversation and dig deep. But here's my warning. 
where I differ from somebody, John Favark, is that he would then go into the individual sort of gnostic, meditative, taking responsibility for myself and thereby solving the problems of the world. No, it takes way more than that. We don't have time for people to sit on their own and being, you know, immersed in their own big fat egos. We, we need to look at the bigger social picture. And the two things we need to solve is how do we tame the instinct towards war and turn it into cosmopolitanism? And how do we tame the instinct towards the hunt and turn that into cotopianism? That means you've got to kill pacifism and kill veganism, not because they want war or because they want to kill you know, thousands of animals to eat or whatever, but just regardless of that, regardless of that. What we mean is that the instinct towards war has to be tamed into cosmopolitanism and the instinct towards the hunt has to be tamed into cotopianism. And, and to do that is fiendishly well, that difficult. I like, I mean, I like well, we, did, we, did, we did it with capitalism in a way because we made capitalism a, a trade system where capital was the ultimate judge mm -hmm. of and, and the value that we they, they valued everything else that we traded. And we successfully in any society except the capitalism had longer periods of peace and were much more successful, which again proves that the trade routes are key to civilization itself. Now, we need to try to tame that again. The only thing we need to do as priests, the only thing we're expected to do is to prolong the peace for as long as possible before everything explodes again. And with atomic bombs around being widespread, climate threat or whatever, and, and strangers killing strangers because they know nothing better to do, then we need to work on technologies and we need to work on religious practices and foster large masses of people to behave in a cosmopolitan way and to go for equatopian solutions. And that's why the dystopias don't work any longer. The dystopias, they run around and say, you're a racist, you're a sexist, and, and by the way, you're evil, or whatever. they don't work. We don't believe any of that nonsense. That's again, Gnostic cheap shots. It's just Gnosticism in its worst form, right? Woke is so fucking Gnostic, it's incredible, right? It does, takes no responsibility for the future of the world at all. Remember Rebecca, it's scapegoating, right? Well, yeah. Hold, this is, hold on, because that's kind of like, um, I agree. 100% with Alexander's analysis of, you know, the problems with Gnostic dualism and the in the Catholic Church, his idea of Gnostic heresy. Uh, but I think there's an, I, I think there were a lot of different kinds of Gnostic groups, and they were all not doing one thing. And many of them were monists, and, and many of them were like, ex extremely uh, uh, realized sort of sort of spiritual teachers and like Meister Eckhart and pseudo Dionysus and these guys that I love to read. So, so, uh, so, so would you call them Gnostics? Oh, I, I say, well, I, I would say that, and, and the whole Jewish, uh, you know, uh, Renaissance uh, tra tradition, they use the word Gnosis a, a lot and, and primordial okay. Gnosis. Okay, okay, let's use, this. let's not confuse ourselves and let's right. use the sort of encyclopedic definition of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the idea that there must be a higher realm of some kind. So the mind must separate itself from the body and the earth is evil and material reality is evil and spiritual reality is fantastic and good. But not everybody can have access to spiritual reality because you've got to be a good guy and a clean soul to get there. So Gnosticism is a very sort of individual work, spiritual work, where it's all about you being superior to others. You, yeah, but it was an early on. But wait a second. Let me finish. Let me finish. The let me finish definition, another, Andrew. Another, please another. let me finish the definition. Okay. We can agree on. Gnosticism does that. Inverted Gnosticism does exactly the opposite, which is celebrating the body and trying to ignore the mind. So it's a complete celebration of pathos without logos. The Gnosticism mm -hmm. is a celebration of logos without inverted power. Gnosticism. Yeah. 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 So yeah. inverted Gnosticism, I include in my description of Gnosticism. The problem here is the separation of mind and body. Okay. Either you work on both mind and body simultaneously, and that is proper spiritual practice. That means you will then represent in whatever way you can through your specialty, either the priestly side or the royal side of the tribe. And you will then respect and admire the other side so the tribe or society can function. Mm -hmm. Gnosticism means I remove myself from society because society itself is evil, so it tries to unify yeah. these two. Whereas I go for the separation, I mean, I'm only going to be a spiritual being and I will then live forever. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that analysis uh, completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is. It's really a, 
a bunch of narcissists that come along during the Axial Age, and then they start booming in the third century in the Persian Empire, and it spreads into the Roman Empire. Christianity tries to deal with it. My problem with Christianity is so much of Gnosticism actually is part of Christianity, that Christianity never really got rid of it, because Christianity also promises you will live forever when you die. And if that's not part of Christianity, I don't know what Christianity is. If you try to deconstruct Christianity so much, there's nothing left of nothing to do with the New Testament, nothing to do with any of the Christian church that practice for 2000 years, that's just imagination. While the magic, that's not Christianity. What I'm talking about, my critique of Christianity, for good and bad, what it's contributed to the world's history, what we can learn from it, is that a lot of the patterns I see in Christianity, that inherited from Judaism and Zoroastrianism, have been very, very useful. But they're not good enough today because the barred absolute has to be reintroduced. Otherwise, people go, they freak out. Yeah, but but, but uh, basically, it's the barred absolute basically means that there is no God who literally tells you what to do. So the literal interpretation of these religious texts is wrong. Yes. So, I mean, that's something that has been around in Christianity forever. I mean, it's, it's, of course, not associated with the most spectacular failures of Christianity. I mean, those ideas have been around in Christianity since... I mean, you can read it in the mystery. That's not Christianity. Christianity starts with Christ on the cross. And when he died, this is the New Testament. This is all the gospels. When he dies on the cross, the yeah. curtain falls in the Jewish temple and there's direct access between man and God. That is Christianity. Well, there's no, there's no God behind Jesus. Ridiculous. That's the other way around. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That is I, I have a, I have a more Bart, kind of like century, an, Bart, one of the greatest yeah. theologians there is no God behind Jesus Christianity basically leads to I mean it's literally a God dying on a cross it's the end of pagan deities the end of pagan gods that's what Christianity is and that interpretation has been has been around for, for forever it's of course not the interpretation that's being sold by, by the guys in the fancy costumes when they talk to the people in the in the in the in the in the square, right? Then you get a simple story and you go to heaven when you die. All religions do that. Maybe not Zoroastrianism, but all religions do that. Buddhism also has very simplified versions of Buddhism, which is all about financial gain and, and reincarnation and stuff like that. But there are much more refined teachings. You can make this criticism about any religion. No, I don't think religions aren't a part of one another. I think there are enormous differences between different religions. Yes, and I, I, I'm looking for the ones that can withhold. I look at the ones that can withhold the current test. This is like a huge shit test on religion. We all know religion has I to agree. be returned. We have to return to religion. Mm -hmm. the, the alternative is just, it's just, it's just miserable. It's just miserable. Okay, so in a Nietzschean way, we have to go through the naive nihilism, the cynical nihilism. We've got to get out of the cynical nihilism. And the two ways of doing that, it's the priestly ironic nihilism, and it's the chief the affirmative nihilism. This is what both Hegel and Nietzsche do in the 19th century to look forward to the return of religion. This is where I'm working. That's, that's what I'm doing philosophically speaking all the time. Now, I, I know there are so many mystical interpretations of Christianity. Basically, these religions are big enough to try to save their asses constantly. Islam has done the same thing, but this is about honorably understanding what alternatives do we have when we try to return to religion. And I would say that these pop religions that we master distributed the last 2000 years are actually the ones that are most dysfunctional today. I'm interested in Vairayana Buddhism with you guys. I'm interested in those practices. I'm interested in Zoroastrianism and Judaism because the religions are richer, older, more complex, understand a complex world better, and therefore, they also have the barred absolute, the very center of everything. It's just not like something that somebody thought of in the fifth century. And he said, then it was gone for 500 years and then maybe returned by Girard and Zizek today. Yeah, but it's, I mean, how do you explain then that, uh, you know, the Western Buddhists, I mean, not exactly a hot bunch, right? I mean, there's not, there's not really, I mean, David Chapman has, uh, so he has a really interesting blog about, uh, about Buddhism and tantric Buddhism and stuff like that. And basically, you know, Western Buddhism isn't really a big success, right? The Western, it uh, isn't Mahayana Buddhism. Is it like isn't it. Buddhism it's, it's, at all. Uh, Stoicism I mean, it's just... and Ep Epicureanism and and uh, New Ageism and uh, and uh, Protest Protestantism and yeah, it's true. It's not. It, I mean, there. 
it's what, e what is, it's what is e-commerce e selling news, crystals. So it's, That's it's what weak. it is. You know, it's, it's weak. Just... It's weak, uh, pretty much. It's weak. It's, it's weak. In in the West, it's it's it, a lot of it is weak. You know. Why do but, you guys but, think? Why do you guys think there was a shift from Mayana to Vairayana? What 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 is that about? Why was there Vairayana? Why was Vairayana even developed? Since you think all religions are about the same, I'm challenging you here when it comes to Buddhism. You obviously have picked. One well, the original the story Buddhism is that the, the original story is you had to teach the king something and the king didn't want to become a monk so <laughs> so 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 you you taught him you taught him these these elaborate you know beautiful uh you know practices uh which, which were, were far more uh, uh you know appealing and and and, and sexy than <laughs> the going and sitting in a, in a cold monastery and eating you know rice gruel or mm -hmm. i mean but but i i think that yeah well i think the vajrayana uh i think that vajrayana um uh is more appropriate for our time because it deals with intense energies and and we have to, we have to work with those especially now <laughs> and uh you've got so, tantra versus but I, I don't I, I don't think it's tantra for everybody Sparta, i don't think so it's for everybody and i don't think that you know in the same yeah, I, like i don't think it's for everybody and i don't think it well, could well, ever Christianity be for everybody basically put it in the in the hands of the of the artist right Okay. You know, the rock okay. and roll and all of that stuff. I mean, that's kind of like, an, an, that, that's an integrated aspect of Christianity. And so that's, that's kind of the tantric side of Christianity. They basically just gave it away to the artists. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not looking for mm -hmm. religion for everybody. I never said that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, yeah. I don't think religion ever was. I think Zoroastrianism understood it greatly and so did Brahmanism compared well, to the rest. There was an interesting moment in Christianity when 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 they, 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 they let in the... Uh, the um the gentiles right christ said no don't let in the gentiles like don't let them in and, and uh and i think paul said no no we have to let in we have to make it universal we have to let in the gentiles yeah no and, and, and so so, 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 so that's where jewish judaism and christianity split because judaism remained this very compressed you know uh you know intense you know, uh, you know, deep thing, and then and then Christianity uh, did try to try try to become a, a, ma a mass religion, and so maybe it succeeded in some ways, and 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 maybe and, and of course because it became so big, it became way more corrupt as well. But that's my thing. I don't believe religion is for everyone to begin with. Okay, what you do in Persia, India, and China is that you allow people to believe anything they like. It's called folk religion, because mm -hmm. people will worship yeah. Madonna. They will worship. They will worship. You know, they worship Disney stars or whatever. They're allowed to worship something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has to Can I just something. finish here? So yeah, sorry. the folk religion is there. It's obvious. It always was there. That's what Catholicism has to introduce the saints because people didn't want to talk to God. They wanted to talk to Virgin Mary, and if they didn't dare to talk to her, they wanted to talk to the local saint or the saint of the guild they belong to, which makes a lot more sense. This is just the you know. Those who have died and went before me, can I talk to them somewhere? Because those who are living and not accessible to me, you talk to somebody else. You, that's what you do when you pray to a saint. Okay, this is folk religion, universal everywhere. It will always be there as long as they're humans. The vast majority of people would do that. But that's also the Nietzsche and slave mentality. Now that's the majority of people. I don't expect the majority of people to do anything else ever. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the religion of a possible elite to guide people to succeed with the products of cosmopolitanism and ecotopianism, saving the planet and saving humanity. Now, if you're gonna do those two things, you've gotta have a religion installed that tames and domesticates us in such a way that that will be the main purpose of our lives. Now, for that to happen, you got to go back to the different spiritual traditions and compare them as we can do today and discover that, oh my God, some of these guys built on, you know, hasty ground and some of them built on solid ground. It's very Christian. Uh, why don't we go to the ones that are the most solid, you know, and dare to compare, make comparative studies like we do with culture. I mean, you, you can't say that all nations in the world are equally successful. You can't say that. That's ridiculous. You can't. You can't compare Canada and Sudan in that way today. You can't do that. That's they're just they're just they're just ignoring the facts out there. In, in cultures where people are dying all the time and they die young and all that, and nobody takes care of anybody and there are no trust chains, those nations are failing. Those cultures are failing. We need to compare different cultures and be allowed to do that. I think it's the same thing with religion and with spiritual practices. When you look at larger populations and the effects, it's not about what everyday people, what they worship, because they have their idols all the time. They have their icons, their iconology all the time. That's okay. We're talking about what the elite, 
the cultural elite to go forward, what kind of exodus they're making and what kind of beliefs they have to make that exodus possible and sustainable. That is a yeah. deeply religious question. Yeah. And, and to make that exodus, I can't say, oh, Jordan Peterson read a couple of New Testament scripts and his, here's his new interpretation or throw a couple of Slovenian philosophers around that said, Christianity was always atheist. Uh, no, it wasn't, right? Thomas of Aquinas was smart enough to play around with that for six, 600 years ago, but it wasn't the majority stance, even because of him and although he was like a major figure in Catholicism, it, that was not the part of Thomas of Aquinas no. that any Pope ever cared for. They did well, not. The majority there was no mystery religion bad, within yeah. Christianity that, that paid, oh, you know, that paid attention to truth. There wasn't because that's not how Christianity was constructed. Christianity did not pay attention to what we do with war and with hunting. That's exactly what was left to state and market. And the reason why it was out of the Christian world that we basically exploited the planet until we ruined it is precisely because state and market were not part of religion. Mm-hmm. That, that's my critique of Christianity. It made it, it made the easier to go universal. It went for mother and child worship and then brought in the saints and had the Pope installed in Rome and just blinded itself to whatever the state and the market was up to. That is the history of Christianity for the past 2000 years. Islam just does it the other way around. It does not blind itself to the other things, but it introduces a God who is a boy and who could never be predicted what he does next. It's essentially cre- creating a religion that looks a bit like Lord of the Flies. <laughs> and then just put the strongest boy in charge and call him Allah and then whatever he's up to, then everybody else is to follow. Because the, the, if there's no distance between God and man, there's also no distance from God to man, and that's essentially the problem with Islam. Eternal jihad. That's what angry boys do. They have outbursts all the time. Yeah, man, 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 man. You know, that's, what, that's basically Islam. And thankfully, at least they kill each other most of the time. But when the Islamists go for others that are non-Muslims, they're not exactly peaceful. You know, They haven't been very good at that. That's the honest truth of the last 1,400 years of Islamic history. And I don't. I think these religions are dysfunctional. I think Taoism needs to be critiqued that it also left out certain aspects that need to be part of religion because what Taoism left out, Confucianism took. And Confucianism is impossible to do anything but create a Prussian dictatorship, which is essentially what communist China still is today. And I think that dialogue with the Chinese and see what Chinese philosophy can develop can also be interesting. But when it comes to the West, we have two alternatives to go back to that are deeper than Christianity and Islam and that never made the temptation to be popular and universal. And if you know anything from the internet today, people who go for the masses, people who go for the quantity will lose the quality in no time at all. So why don't we go to the spiritual traditions that never cared about proselytizing, never really cared. That basically said, if you want to go into this, it's challenging, it's hard work, mm-hmm. but it pays off. Because I think those are the only alternatives that actually make sense in the complex world we live in now. Well, that's what I did, but. <laughs> yeah, you did. So did Thomas. I mean, yeah. hey, I'm defending Vajrayana Buddhism. You convinced me that it definitely qualifies as an adult religion, a religion mm-hmm. of adultification. Now, I don't want to go with a religion that proclaims that its followers are the children of God and pretends that naivety is a good thing. It's not. That's a lie. That's fundamental to Christianity. Sorry. Okay. I can't stay with that. I can't, I can't defend that position. I think it's weak. <laughs> You can make exactly the same story about Buddhism. You can make exactly the same story about tantric Buddhism. I mean, you can always kind of, you know, doing a religion right is a lot of work. Most people will get it wrong. The big public yeah. will get it wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's very difficult to kind of get a keep even even Christianity. I mean, uh, 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 this is a religion whose central text is about a man that was killed by a mob. Now, the Catholic Church has killed a lot of people that way which goes directly against their founding document. So yes, religions do not make sense, but if you look at the core of the ideas, why are they, why did, are they still around? How did they keep people from killing each other? How did did they allow uh, civilizations to be built up, which certainly happened in Christianity, which certainly happened in in, in Islam. Islam is maybe not such a good state right now, but it did create a lot of, a lot of uh, very fantastic cultures. So the question is you look at a religion and then you say, what does it make? Why did it survive? 
That's the core that makes sense. And that's the core that I will look up. And all of the rest, all of these accretions, all of this dust that has kind of layers and layers of dust on the good idea that you blow away. And you need to do that for any religion, whether it's Judaism or Christianity or Islam or whatever. You need to do that individually or with a community around you. There is no religion that comes with a package deal, right? You know, we got it figured out. Here, you can follow this and this will work. That just doesn't, that just doesn't. Well, there might be qualitative differences between religion, though. Of course, there are, I mean, there, 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 I mean there's no, if Christianity survives, it will have to change a lot. Christi the religions always change. There is no fixed religion. The, the, for example, the, the, a lot of core ideas that people associate with Christianity, they are, they are less than a thousand years old. Like for okay, example, I disagree. Christ, Christ, I dis Thomas, Christ I disagree strongly with that. I do not think religions people. change at all. And I think that's the key here. I think there are only two stories hmm. to be told and they're called process and event. There's only nomadology and eventology. And with the possibility that the Hegelian Nietzsche negation of the negation opens up for a third idea, I don't think any other ideas have been developed over the last 10,000 years. I think we're going back to the same positions all the time. And the only difference we made 4,000 years ago was the innovation of the event to break the eternal return of the same. Because otherwise you go with the Buddha, you stay with the eternal return of the same, you go towards extinction and get rid of it. Otherwise you got to go for the event. And that's the West. Anything West of the Gobi Desert decided to go for the eventology, China and India refused and stayed with the eternal return of the same. That's a fact, that's a historical fact and it comes to the history of ideas. We can now share with the Chinese and the Indians and the Persians and everybody else, we can share these different stories and look at them over, over the trade, you know, over the time of the history of the trade routes and everything, and look at the different spiritual schools and understand what is process, what does it mean, what is event? And in what way is event either leading to trauma or leading to the ecstatic? The, 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 this, this, is, this is essential. These are the only ideas out there that are really profound ideas. I mean, the, okay, good. Nomadology and eventology, I think that, that seems to be a very big idea. I agree with that. But you also have the, the shift from pagan religion to religion that is not pagan. You have a religion that is based on, on sacrifice, on, on mobs that kill scapegoats. And there are religions who try to go away from that. That has happened in Buddhism, that has happened in Christianity, that has happened in Hinduism, as far as I understand from Girard. That's also a very, very important part of the story. Yeah, okay. But that development does not have to do with religion per se. That development has to do with that you stop being nomadic and you settle. You settle in villages. They go to war with one another no. because the tribes did. Then you've got to figure out how to have peace between the villages. The villages grow and become cities. And the larger the populations become, the less chains of trust you have between people living very closely. No, in the no, well, well, that's and your that interpretation, you but that, that's not your art it, theory. That's not I know it's not Shirat, but Shirat, Shirat thinks ideas dominate human beings, but I don't think, I think behaviors come out of the technological necessities and context we live within. And eventually after bloody periods, we've got to figure out better ways of living together like we do now. We've got to figure out ways that work when things don't work. That is the development of religion you're talking about. But in that case, religion only reacts to the environment where it's located. It's still religion about process or event. And what you then do is that you construct okay, so, an sorry, question, question. So yeah. you think that the scapegoating arose when people started living in settlements? No, but I think it intensified. I think it intensified. I think we got more shift. organized. We got definitely yes. more organized. It's bigger. We started with Pagan lynch mobs today. Me too was ready. millions of people, right? And quickly organized. Kept each other from killing each other. So this is like super, super old. This is like... I mean, this is like before people could talk, right? This is when they were kind of grunting at things. They kept the, the violence within the tribe away by killing individuals regularly. And that yeah. turned into religion. That's the, 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 that's the, the origin of religion. The religion is our only defense it's, against... It's getting that. rid of mm -hmm. violence in the tribe by being violent. Yeah, okay, but Girard's problem That's is that he thinks, religion. no, this, he, he thinks of this strictly as intertribal. My argument against Girard is that it's an intertribal phenomenon. Violence is limited within the tribe. The elders make sure of that, you know. No, it's done by, no. by scapegoating. No, the that doesn't, no, I disagree with Girard. Let me finish where I disagree with him, for God's sake. So the thing is though, the bigger problem is the two river problem. So that means you've got one, 
history here, one lineage here along one river. You got another history, another lineage along the other river. And, and Russian historians have proven that the bloodiest periods of history are always the ones right after paradigm shifts. So as soon as we settled and populations grew in their about with massive murder, right? Yeah, you went from one river and killed the ones at the other river. You went up the river and killed people. This went on for like a thousands of years, right? And then you had to come up with a story, a narrative that unified people further down. This is what we call the root of the phallus. You gotta go, you gotta create a more of an origin. You gotta go deeper down. You gotta claim that history is older than we thought and there's shared ancestry. And the shared ancestry idea, then when you built the cigarettes, you built these huge temples that were perfectly located between the rivers or between poles at the river. So you got two villages between the rivers or between the rivers. This is where you located the ziggurats. These are the temples. This is the construction of religion. This is evidence that religion existed and started getting organized. And it started taming people. You know, the bloodshed started dropping. That was the success of This is where you and I and Girard all agreed. But Girard comes back to the intra-tribal tension within the tribe and the envy, which existed. That has existed forever. I agree with Gerard, but religion in a more organized form when it comes to taming us that we're interested in today is when larger populations occur and we settle permanently and property has to be respected and protected and we need to build armies to protect and respect the property. And then we've got to come up with stories because otherwise we'll never let a stranger in through the, in through the wall into our walled city and we'll never let the shit out that we also need to let out. And then the membranics of a society fail and it dies. So th that's religion, that's when it gets organized and monotheism comes out of that, but monotheism does, is not, monotheism, polytheism exist in parallel. That is the important lesson from these. Monotheism is the religion of the priests themselves. So they can conduct their concern for the people to keep them at peace with one another. That is then polytheism is the popular religion. Catholicism understood that. That's why I think it will survive Protestantism because it kept the polytheistic element and kept it as an iconology of saints. And then it gave monotheism over to the priest and you go to the confession booth so the priest can talk to God directly or rather you go and pray to a saint. That is genius because that, that worked for Catholicism for 2000 years. So I think that is, to, that is what I talk about religion when it goes inter-tribal, when we start to figure out how do we not kill the other tribe? And it's essentially, these are the shamans who live in between the tribes who become priests and put in robes. And they try to figure out, listen, uh, would it be better if we just traded and my daughter from this tribe married your son from that tribe? And we try to deal with trade for a while. And that's how the first empires developed. The empires were essentially less bloodshed, more larger organization, roads being built between them, irrigation expanded, aqueducts built, water flushing here and there, engineering booming, and then you build larger temples and castles eventually, and prosperity arrives in history. And these empires eventually lead to ideas that, my God, we've succeeded to create something bigger than the tribe. It's called empire. Oh, why don't we have small local promises so people feel aligned to one another and share their religion within that tribe? And that's nationalism and that starts the Judaism. So the, that's the way I see the history of religion much more. The problem then is that when you come to these guys who walk out of the pillar saint mode and have easy solutions to everything, I say, if you only do this and this and this and the three fixes and then you go to heaven. Uh, uh, and by the way, somebody else died for you and therefore you can go to heaven if you just pray to him, whatever. These quick fixes and the shortcuts are what I call pop religion. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I do not deny that there's enormous power in Christian mysticism. There's enormous power in Islamic mysticism. Those are the things in Islamic Christianity that I gladly indulge in and love and all that. But Islamic Christianity as a whole are no longer fit when we've discovered that pop religion doesn't work. And what Nietzsche killed was pop religion, but Nietzsche did not kill religion. I think he would agree today if we said that. Yeah, so maybe the difference here is that Gerard sort of thinks that we're, the, the, he sort of sees everything within the umbrella of Christianity and, and, uh, and you're arguing we're in a post-Christian age. That's kind of, if yeah, would, it's like it's like anthropologists uh, always concentrate which, on the tribe as doesn't. they should. But when you go out of anthropology into history, then you see larger populations, larger constructions, and that's why I'm interested in empires and nations. Why? Because empires are the only constructions we ever made that were larger than tribes that actually could work today and save us. We need empire again. We wrote a book called The Global Empire in 2003, and basically said that the internet has potential to create at least a technological empire, even if humans don't get it, 
but that could save us and, and that potentially what we have to work on. That was 17 years ago. It's becoming quite obvious that without that sort of protocol, we will not survive. Ecotopianism requires it. Cosmopolitanism requires it. And I would then say that the third one, after ecotopianism and cosmopolitanism, and I've looked into this since last week, is religion containing sexuality. So these are all exploitations rather than exploitations. Like how do you get sustainable value out of something so it can both last and you can get value out of it? For example, how do you grow a garden and that garden is still there next year? That's exploitation, not exploitation. Because you're not exploiting something to kill it. You're employing it to make it survive and also then bear the fruits from it. A fruit tree or a vineyard, perfect example of exploitation. So ecotopianism is the exploitation of the hunt. Cosmopolitanism is the exploitation of the war. If you can manage to do those two things, that would be fantastic tricks. And that's what empires have always tried to do when they go into periods of peace. Religion itself is fundamental the exploitation of the sexual act. We would probably, after today's conversation, also say that it's definitely also containing violence. Religion is the name for the human attempt at containing violence and control it, and then also to put the sexual act in its proper place. And of mm -hmm. course, Islamic Christianity went after sexuality. That's again a sign that they went for the masses and the quantity and pretended to sexuality was just swept under the floor and it was nothing else but reproduction. We keep it there and we love yeah. our women or whatever. I was and talking we, to we, John we, about- We know that's also impossible. We can't go back and say that to anybody today. It's about, we have to now discuss sexuality. Are we over-sexualized or under-sexualized? What does it mean to men? What does it mean to women? And try to redefine what it is. And I think it makes much more sense to look at systems in the past where sexuality was a non-issue. Yeah. I think Thomas agrees with me that cultures with sexuality is a non-issue. It's not moralized against, but it's not a big deal. Probably the ones that figure out where to put it properly in their culture. Yeah, I was talking to John about St. Augustine, and I think a lot of the problem starts there. Like St. Augustine was a, a kind of, he was like, he was addicted to sexuality and some, like he was, he was just completely, uh, and then, and then he totally, he totally viewed it as a sin afterwards. He went the other way. And so he invented these two notions of, 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 of uh, original sin and eternal damnation. Like those come yeah. straight from Augustine. Those the worst, most terrible ideas ever. Gnostic ever in, ideas, in Gnosticism. Uh, that is the problem. From, from Augustine, Augustine, and, Augustine. Yes. And, and, yes. And, and, and yes. that, yes. that polluted Christianity. Um, I don't know what I don't know. You know what the problem with with Islam is because I don't know enough about it in terms of sexuality. But but uh, but uh, but if you if you compare them to like the crazy wisdom masters of the East who 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 slept with prostitutes and lived in brothels and had these wild, were these wild characters who there's folk tales about them and and they they healed people and and you know uh, it's it's just such a breath of fresh air compared to this like Augustinian. Uh, uh, Christianity. <laughs> anyway. Well, you have two major, very successful Gnostic pop religions that we deal with here. That part of, again, when I say the West, I mean the Middle East and then Europe added the last 300 years. That's the West historically. So the West is like from Persia westwards. Uh, and Manichaeism was the most widespread religion in the world in the fourth century. It exploded. It was incredibly popular, which again goes to show that popularity is not necessarily a sign of quality. Yeah, and Augustine and the was the Manichaean. And the, Manichaean, the Manichaeans, and that's where St. Augustine came from. Yeah. He came from Manichaeism, and the Manichaeans were adamant that everything in the world was evil and nasty, and, and everything material would have to go away, and the devil had created the world. The demi had created the world. They yeah. took Plato and just overdid him completely, and then turned it into a mass religion was spread across the Eurasian continent. It was incredibly mm -hmm. popular. It, it covered, you know, it got way into China, it, all the way into the Mediterranean. And it dominated, you know, in, in the Persian Empire, was obviously going up against Zoroastrianism as, as, a, as a sort of the state religion of the Persian Empire. And the Zoroastrians went after the Manichaeans. And they, there was like civil war because of it, because the, the Zoroastrians with their modest worldview, but united our master two different aspects of the same thing you know that was totally adamant that was totally wrong to the Zoroastrians and then along came another cult called the Mastakites and if you look at anything like Rousseau and lynch mobs today hey look at Mastak he, he everything must be the, the idea the that a society socialist. must have a quality of outcome yeah. Yeah. the absurdity of that idea is Mastak huh. and it was horrible what happened eventually he was hanged somewhere and killed 
later was Mastak was reintroduced as a hero, both of communism and Islam, but to the Zoroastrians, it was just, thank God we got rid of him because it's sort of this Gnostic poison that went through society, Zoroastrians at least, was, was like, it's killing the culture. And then eventually, of course, the Sassanid the Empire was plagued. It, it was plague. It was ruined because of the wars with Byzantines. And when you come to the seventh century and you got some Persians that you would want to go up against the emperor, the Persians are aligned with some Arab traders. And they take this guy who's never written a word in his life, who is actually a brilliant warlord. His name is Muhammad. And a Persian guy writes a book for him called the Quran. And it's, it's basically Mao's little bread. It's a pop book, if anything. There's no depth to the Quran at all, to be honest about it. And it's thrown out and it becomes a really successful widespread religion because it's also a military religion compared to Christianity. It has an army that expands quickly everywhere. That is Islam. So the Mastakites won. It's called Islam. And the Manichaeans influenced Christianity immensely. And if you read the history of Christianity, what church fathers believed, what people believed when they went to church, what was preached to people, the way the Bible was interpreted, the war between the Catholics and the Orthodoxy in the East makes perfect sense because then you look at the theological struggles in Byzantine and Rome at the time, they were not Christian atheists in the sort of Slavish way at all. They, they were adamant, they were serious about the Trinity and what existed and what didn't exist and what had ontological reality to it and what didn't. And that was Christianity as far as I'm concerned in the last 2000 years. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm attracted to the Orthodox just because they, they're, they, they kind of, they're kind of pre-modern and they, they kind of, they don't have this idea of original sin and no, like hey, wait, the a, wait a second. They wait don't a have second. The idea of, they don't actually have the idea of eternal damnation or, 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 or uh, well, they're or, fucked up about sexuality. Scene. And that's, well, did we yeah, agree that that was a bad a sign? Patriarchal or something. They don't like, no, they, they, they don't take their clothes off and swim naked anywhere at any time. These are the, the most prude people uh, you could possibly find in Orthodox Christians. But then you find, uh, there, you know, a little these like, uh, like uh, Rasputin and, and all these like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, never mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in religions that somehow yeah. figured out to put violence and sex in their proper places and they're not too naive about it. Not yeah. that we can ever be harmonious or balanced about those things. Constructively, it's, it's Christianity is a sutric religion. It's a renunciate religion. It will never work by itself. If you only do that, that will never, ever work. So you need the two. You need to have a you need to have a sutric layer. That's what the, that's the brilliance of the Buddhist, right? The, the brilliance yeah. of the Christians is is exposing the scapegoat mechanism. That was yeah. brilliant. The New Testament, in, in combination with the Old Testament, basically the end of pagan religion. Do not form mobs and kill people. That's a bad idea. That's and the and the Trinity, because it led to the possibility of power sharing in the West. Trinity leads to power sharing. That's okay. a, that's well, a brilliant idea. idea. But the, it was the, borrowed the, from the Persians, and that's why it worked. But, but yeah. the brilliant idea of Buddhism is is to have this subdivision in in sutra, tantra, and dzogchen. So you have the you have the the renunciation layer. You have the transformation layer, which Christianity has never well. I mean, it has embraced it to some extent, but, but very limited. It basically said like you know, go and do some parties outside of the religion. You know, that's our that's our tantra. And then you have the third layer in Buddhism, and that's dzogchen. So you have renunciation, um, transformation, and then self-liberation. You, you basically need these three layers. Otherwise, you, you end up in, in, uh, in guilt. If you only do sutra, sutra you yeah. end up in hedonism. If you only do, uh, if you only do tantra, and you, you need this kind of this junction layer to kind of, kind of like, you know, okay, transformation, working on yourself, going from here to there, or sutra, renunciation. But junction is basically like you work what, what, what is now, and you work with that. You and dissolve the whole thing. It's, it's, they call it the blue it's, uh, pancake. It's amor fati of, of Nietzsche. Yeah. So Nietzsche Explain this better. Explain this yeah. more, both to me and everybody else who's listening to the conversation. Explain the difference between Tantra and Dzogchen specifically. Yeah. Try the, to the nail it. Well, in, in Tantra, there's still this idea that there, I am here and I'm going to go there. So there's a so subtle there's duality, a very, very subtle to, duality. To improve myself, right? There's still this idea that there's something to, I am here and it's not good enough and I'm going to go there. So there's an idea of transformation. So in Dzogchen, you radically let that go. Yeah. That idea of, of transformation. Yeah. Trump, Trump called it the, the old dog stage, right? So, so it, you know, it, it's beyond, beyond the, the sort of ch change. It's, it's, non, it's pure non-duality. There's, there's, there's nothing to achieve, nothing to gain. There's nothing, nothing to, to achieve. There's nothing to do. But of course, if you'd stick into that, then you're also deluded, right? And you're going yeah. to these, you know, these Western Buddhists are going like, it's all yeah, they perfect. Think 
you know, I, I mean, uh, you know, my, 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 you know, my, my child died yesterday. Oh, you know, there must be some higher meaning or it's all perfect as it is, of course, nonsense. Um, so, so all of these, so there's these, these three tracks, right? And they all come yeah. with- There's actually own. nine vehicles in Buddhism, but the three, like, you can subdivide them further even, but, but there's Mahamudra as well and other things, but- yeah, mm -hmm. Maha Yoga and Anu Yoga yeah. and stuff like but that. But this is really interesting. So would you so say- they're vehicles, they're called vehicles. In other words, you progress through them. Like you progress through them. When one vehicle doesn't make sense to the other vehicle, like, like, uh, like, uh, it's like that you, you can't understand if you're in the sutra, you can't understand the, the, the tantra. And if you're, you know, in the tantra, you don't quite understand the zochin. And, you know, so it's like, it's like, uh, you can't understand from the lower stage. You can't understand the, 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 the next stage. Oh, dialectics. So it's, it's dialectics <laughs> and it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, refined sort of, you know, system of, 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 of growth, you know, of, of, you know, from I'm so happy about you guys tonight because you just turned the whole thing around and you proved that I was right. The Vajrayana is a <laughs> religion. Yeah. Precisely by like Thomas said that if it's only sutric, it's only half the religion. I would say Christianity is good enough to be folk religion. I don't have a problem with that at all. I think the reason why it's Christianity and Buddhism religion. are trading places yeah, is that they're, as, as they're being folk. used as folk religions. It's Buddhist folk religion that was important to the West, Western Buddhism, just like Christianity being imported now to Asia is basically American Protestantism, which is folk religion, if anything. I don't know if Christianity is very good sutra. I mean, I, I'm sorry to say that, but- <laughs> It's only sutra. What? No, it's, it's, it's only point. sutra. Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. I think it's more like Mahayana and it's more like the, 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 some, it's got some aspects of Mahayana. It's sort of poor suture because it's filled with all this complexity of this moral complexity and complex. Well, Mahayana, of, wouldn't you, that, yeah. wouldn't you call that, wouldn't you group that with Sutra? Mahayana is not Tantra, right? Um, well, no, it's not Tantra. No, Maya, Tantra is called Mahayana. the great vehicle. So, so you have the, the narrow vehicle, which is discipline, Hinayana. You, yeah. you have Mahayana, which is the great, uh, great vehicle. So this is when you're not self-concerned, when you become in service of, of people. And so it has this, this altruist, very altruistic flavor to it. Also, the philosophy gets very deep, right? Like the philosophy goes very far in Mahayana. So actually the view, the philosophical view of Vajrayana is Mahayana. But Mahayana doesn't goes be or Vajrayana sort of goes beyond philosophical discussion and gets into so it goes beyond yeah, because Mahayana is not Tantra, right? What Mahayana the view, of, the view of the view of 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 the highest view of Mahayana is the view of of, of Tantra, <laughs> actually. But 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 Tantra is also this path of skillful means, which is, so it's all these methods which go, go goes beyond philosophy in a certain extent because it's 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 phenomenological, it's purely phenomenological, you know, method. I want to go back to the Vajrayana definitions of Tantra and Dzogchen, how they differ from one another, and I then want to discuss how that relates to process and or event. Hmm. So. Aren't you saying that with Dzogchen, you actually throw it all back to the nomadological and you sort of give up on the eventological, which is interesting, deeply interesting. I think it's a, it's a, I think it's a unity of the two in a sense. Um... Okay, I'll explain eventology and nomadology in short. So eventology is the idea that an event can happen that changes history forever. So there's a prior to and there's an after that event. Christ on the cross is clearly eventological. Christianity mm -hmm. is dependent completely on an event. Islam, the same thing. Muhammad did certain things and Allah did certain things. And depending on whether you're Sunni or Shia, the certain events that have happened, you've got to plague yourself, you know, you've got to torture yourself forever because that event happened on a certain date. Events. It's all event driven, right? And if you don't follow the right event, your heretic and will kill you. <laughs> Typical for Islam, right? Eventological religions. They're pop eventologists, though. With Judaism and Zoroastrianism, we take the eventology slightly more seriously. Now, obviously, in Judaism, it's the three exoduses. They've added the third one, which is the, you know, the rise of the state of Israel in 1948. But before that, you had the exodus out of Egypt and the exodus out of Babylon. They shaped Jewish history and they shaped the Jewish religion. And they also admit that they changed religion and altered the religion with each exodus. So it's a religion of exodus, of anything. It's a religion of nationalism, if anything, that's Judaism. With Zoroastrianism, it's basically just the insight that the son can make the world different than the father, hopefully better, not guaranteed, simply because there's more information accumulated. 
That's all there's to it. The, the Gothos is very clear on this, that it's perfectly okay to live a nomadic life, but we'll never improve on anything. And our children will die when they're young. And, you know, we've actually discovered something called permanent settlement. That's what Gothos says. And the permanent settlement must be defended against the nomadic hordes because the nomads are just running in and stealing everything and have not invested anything. So they're basically thieves, druj, who steal from those who have invested and worked hard, which is Asha. So it's the defense of the people who invest in the future. That's what's easy to connect Tantra to Asha, Druid, and Zoroastrianism, because the fundamental Tantric principle, philosophically speaking, is that if you invest in the future, if you don't come now, then it will get much better later. It pays off to be an adult. Yeah. It pays off to negate what you have now to have something better later. It pays off to have constraints around what you do because you get more creative that way. Again, tantric. So this is what this is what Zoroastrianism and Vajrayana Buddhism have in common that I'm so interested in. But at the end of the day, there's not a final claim from Zoroaster that event is the shit and process must go. He allows for process to stay in folk religion. He allows for process to stay in the military religion, which is Mithraism, which is the cult of the slaying of the bull, which is repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated over and over again, because men need to believe in the eternal return of the same, which is the Mithra slaying the bull. Mithra slaying the bull again and again. Uh, and, and of course, in folk religion, that was part of it. It's only out of Zurvanism and the priest religion that the idea comes forward that there could be a shift. And I argue even radically that we cannot even prove that the event ever happened with humanity because we haven't really changed at all in the past 10,000 years. The event was rather that we started talking and then we started writing and then we started printing and then we started, oh, go interactive 30 years ago. Those are the events, according to my writing of history, that's how I rewrite Zoroastrian history. That's the proper Zoroastrian take on history. And then the question is, what do we do? Then we started becoming interactive and we can't put the genie back into the bottle. And this is now a fact. And a new God called the internet, which is very Ahura to me as a master is, has apparently conquered the planet. Now, how do we do that? How do we put some master into the system? Because obviously the system itself will only be Ahura. This is how you practice or ask them today. But at the end of the day, we die. At the end of the day, civilizations die. And probably at the end of the day, humanity will die too. And Mortida will win, not Libido. And then event never really happened <laughs> because everything is then recycled on a universal level by the universe dying or the universe being reborn. Mm -hmm. So it's an interest in the Varayana and Zoroastrian go, as, go so deep as to preach the event yeah. as well, the capacity Tantra means for society to develop. Tantra so we can, be we can yeah. believe as Varayana Buddhists and Zoroastrians, we can believe that we can tame violence and we can, ta can tame the se sexuality in such a way that we can maintain, we can maintain human life on this planet. You know, it's just, that's interesting, but there's no illusion that the event itself is the end game or, or it, yeah. that it's changed history forever, that process is gone. Well, Cadell told me he thought that Buddhism isn't wasn't a real religion because it, did, it doesn't have a hi historical, you know, uh, there's no there's no event in, in history or, or something like that that matters. There's no promise. It's like uh, maybe that's a Western. Maybe he's right. Maybe that's that's a, a Western discussion. West, the West cannot Western decide thing. what a religion is. Yeah, religion is how the elders yeah. try to tame the young. This is how wisdom tries to tame energy, loving energy, but trying to tame energy so it becomes wise. Yeah. The relationship between wisdom and energy is what religion does. That's why it's mainly a masculine enterprise. And yeah. I would say spirituality is basically a female enterprise. Masculine enterprise meaning the original division between mind and body as unity. How yeah. do you keep mind and body separate while well, also understanding those two different aspects of the same thing? Mind yeah. and body. Then comes separating war and hunting because killing a human being is after all different than killing an animal. But certainly if it's somebody from your own tribe, right? Um, and then next to that is the possibility of the difference between masculine and feminine. And then it's hopefully enjoyable once we get there, because otherwise we're raping the next village. And then it's a dark sexual act. But yeah, it's, that's where sexuality belongs and fits into the picture. Yeah. Well, when I like when I was at the uh, at the Buddhist uh, temple, um, the three year retreat center, um, you look uh, all over the walls where were pic huge pictures of, of copulating bodhisattvas like in sexual union really colorful baroque like you wouldn't believe right uh just bright things like just just intense bright phenomenological you know experience right that's that and then on the ground there was like 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 skulls of uh you know uh, uh 
um, there were there were like dead animals, uh, skulls and things like, for, so there was this intense life and this intense death. And so there was, I think the Vajrayana experience is, is, is like you create a mandala, uh, you know, you create a, you create an event, you could say like an, an intense, intense experience event could be a very blissful or, you know, you know, whatever. Uh, you, 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 you create an orgy of the senses kind of, right? And then in the Dzogchen part, you, 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 dissolve, you dissolve the whole thing. So one part, of, you know, one part of the retreat, you're doing that. And then the next part of the retreat, you're, you, you've thrown, you just chuck everything away and, and you're just like, you gotta, you know. <laughs> yeah, but just to make a thing clear though, so we use the proper distinctions here. The way I use event here- Yeah, I don't know if I'm using process. event correctly. Okay, but, no, but, exactly. Right. It's celebrating midsummer or celebrating the winter solstice or something are not events at all. That, that's just process. That's just no, something that happens every year the same this way. This is not a- Event is something it's... unique. Event yeah. is something that only happens once. But this isn't a celebrating the seasons. It's not, a, it's not that at all. It's, it's, a, it's you create an entirely, you know, novel situation. So in that sense, it's not like a, like a, a folk religion. Um, like you create, you create, you know, you create collective art, like there's dancing and eating and but that, that is, that is like the festival. Right. But also, but also there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, there's a transcendent aspect to that. Um, I don't know how to, I don't know how to. Explain. Oh, you get, you, you get to be shamanic for a while. It's like just the land. You get to be shamanic for a while. Yeah. No, yeah. On different on share. Like so Disneyland. That's, uh, yeah. that's the Dionysian way of being, right? It's that liminal space where uh, ordinary distinct distinctions disappear. And that's something that Christianity says, don't do that. Yeah. And yeah, right. Intoxicate, you intoxic you get intoxicated. Like you drink a lot of alcohol. That that would be one thing. To intoxicate. The Dionysian. Right? It's, it's like that's it's, what I yeah. call the barred absolute. This is what yeah. happens behind the barred absolute, not for everyone, but for those yeah. who are it's, it's not like a teenage party. It's like you get, no. you know, you, you, you try to intoxicate the ego. You're you're look you're it's it's a very refined kind of event. So the, the problem with, with removing that type of energy completely is that it finds a way out. Uh, and in a chaotic, it comes out in a chaotic way. And that's, that's the danger that we are facing yeah. now. And that's why we have, for example, all these woke mobs. And we have this, this, this strange of obsession with, um, with uh, we basically have this new Puritanism. And this is, these are all symptoms of religion breaking down and people trying to get a, 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 a replacement for the, for the, the, the Dionysian rituals that they, they feel is, is what they need. That's yeah. essentially what's going sure. on. And, and Buddhism has said like, well, we have of course a sutra layer and that's kind of a very important layer. You cannot do Tantra without Sutra. So you need to have this discipline, this renunciation, but then you carefully bring the Dionysian back and you have the real Dionysian, not the, the fake Dionysian. And that, that was basically Nietzsche's big point, right? When he was, he was basically at, at uh, he, he's, Nietzsche is essentially uh, a very nice uh, philosophical description of the tantric attitude, essentially. Yes. Yeah. I agree strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. But that's that's what was lacking, and that's why he went for the death of the Protestant Christian God. Because yeah, but, he, but he he didn't have enough sutra. I mean, he, he can. There's a lot of stuff. He also. I mean, he, he basically went off the deep end, and that's also it's a good illustration of what can happen if you if you don't have a good sutra layer on top of your tantric practice. Or you don't have a yeah. teacher. You, normally in tantra, you need you need you need to you need to be. Yeah, he was you can't very just do alone. it on your own. You can't do it on it your own. Yeah. No, 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 no. But that yeah. is the bard absolute again. That means that somebody who's been there before is already immersed in it can guide you through it because you cannot do it on your own you can't you yeah, can't grow yeah. you can't adult do it without own. adults guiding you. you that's why you mimic when you're yeah. a child and then once you become an adult you go through these other phases and you many of them will be you know a tower with a door that's locked and a sign that says you'll never be ready for this maybe your children will be but you won't that's the ultimate bar absolute these are the things you must not go into at all during your life because you're not fit for it you're not the archetype that can handle that. Yeah. And, and of course, to tell that to people who've been told for the past 400 years, if you only make money, anything can be bought and sold. Yeah. I, it's I, exactly I, what we're doing now. It's exactly we're saying that, no, yeah. capitalism cannot get you in here. Attentionalism cannot get you in here. Oh, you're popular. We don't care. You are the wrong person at the wrong time. And you probably will always be the wrong person. Sorry. You will not be able to go through this door because you will not be able to handle it. Actually, not only that, not only will it kill you if you go through the door, but you will cause destruction on the rest of us if you do. You must not go through that door. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you have to work and study a lot first. That right? is the bar absolute. The bar absolute is a social function. It's not about you or what you want to do. And, and, you know, like if you only go through these steps and if you handle step six, seven, eight, and then you get the good grades, then you're ready for it. No, 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 no. The bar absolute is that somebody walks out of the bar absolute who's in there and obviously survives in that environment and tells that this is not an easy thing to be part of. Are you ready for it? And they check you out and say, actually, yeah, sure you're not ready for it. And by the way, you don't even have the talent for it. You're in the wrong place. There might be other bar absolutes you would have access to because you're the right archetype there, but you're the yeah. wrong person for this environment. You must yeah. not be in here. But that's also interesting in the tantric tradition also is that you you create a mandala and in a mandala is, is a realm and each realm has an archetype in it. And you you go in the realm that is associated with your archetype. Like you might go in the south, where, which is yellow. And that's the, that's the, the, the you know, the Southern Buddha. And he's, he's a, the Southern Buddha is kind of a, he, he, he's, he's like a, he's, he, he, he's like a, it's all about, a, you know, sensual experience, you know, and then in, in the East, uh, the Buddha's is about, you know, it's about intellect and cutting intellect. And in the North, the Buddha's like a man of action. And, you know, so there's all these archetypes, right, which in the mandala, which, which express different personality types, very elemental personality types. And, and you, you work with that to find out, you know, wh you know, where you belong in that, in that, in that, um, in that model. It is a fuller understanding of what it means to be human. It mm -hmm. has all the aspects. It has the pathos, the logos, and the mythos. It has the interactions between pathos, logos, and mythos contained in the religion. This is my description of what I call adult religion. I completely subscribe to the idea that Vajrayana Buddhism qualifies as a grown-up religion. Especially since it has the dog show on top of the tantra, which I think is fantastic. Because it basically says that at the end of the day, Mortita will eat libido too. But while libido lasts, you can do this and this and this and this. And it might pay off in leaving something behind the next generation can do something else with. That's where Zoroastrian comes in. Zoroastrian essentially says that, yes, your life will probably be as mundane as everybody else's. If you long, live a long and rich life, you should be happy. You should thank the gods for it, call the hard work, talk, you live a full life. But ultimately you desire a transcendence. It's not about your immortality. It's about immortality was you just constructed, was you just built. That can be passed on to the next generation so they can start from a higher point of civilization than you did when you started. That is Zoroastrian, deeply Zoroastrian. The idea that civilization can even exist is Zoroastrian. And then they eventually develop empires with power sharing structures, understanding that if power sharing is not installed from day one, these systems will not hold. Pragmatic starts there. The, the, to begin with, the priest and, and the king must not be the same person. They must even be separated, different courts, different capitals, all of them in the same empire. But Christianity just goes with one of them and somehow kills the other and, and then leaves that to the state and the market to take care of, which is exactly what both made Europe thrive, made capitalism thrive, but also at the end of the day meant that Europe was a place where religion was only for old ladies and a few children and the religion of men had disappeared completely. It is men who suffer in the West from not having a proper religion to relate to. To me, that means that Christianity failed in that department because it wasn't built for men. It denied, it castrated men, terrified of men, and said we should go for pacifism and veganism and all these well, other well, things. The, 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 the Girardian view about this, right? Girard would say we are in apocalyptic times because now basically Christianity has done what it was supposed to do. What was it supposed to do? It was supposed to expose the scapegoat mechanism and we don't have that mechanism anymore to pacify our internal aggression. Even the woke mobs there is no unanimity. There are always people who don't really buy into it anymore. And you need unanimity to actually make this process work. So Christianity kind of got rid of paganism. So that was basically the role of Christianity. And now we are in apocalyptic times because Christianity has done its role. It's dismantled paganism. And now the question is, where are we going to go now if we, don't wanna, if we don't want to disappear? And there, indeed, Christianity is a bit like, well, you know, that's, that was not what I was set out to do, right? I've done my, my, my chair, my, my, my part. And now, now basically, where are we going to go next? That's where we are now. That's what we are discussing. So what's it going to be now? So we had paganism, Roman Empire, we had Christianity and fantastic. And what now? 
the, the rest of the world are the Persian Empire, the Indian Empire, the Chinese Empire, and they have a history that's even older than ours. And we can also learn from them and be in discussion and dialogue with them. Yeah, of course, we have Buddhism yeah. and stuff. So the question yeah. is also, how can we, we... So I think that this is something that you find important, uh, Alexander, and I agree with it, is that we want to have a very pluralistic society where you, have very, where you can have mm -hmm. many different views and many ways of being without people attacking each other and killing each other. Yeah. And that might require isolation into closed communities and, and uh, increasing privacy and things like that. But I think that is one of the very important um, questions. Well, cosmopoles have worked. So cosmopoles have worked over time and remained usually peaceful. It's because they're built on trade and they're built on segregation that is chosen. So it's voluntary segregation. You've got Chinatown there, you've got Jewtown there, so that works. Mm -hmm. You have your own community that shares your beliefs, have the same skin, same skin color, whatever you want. They speak the same language. They read the same paper in the morning, as Hegel said. You cannot build any system unless people read the same newspaper in the morning. That's what the European Union doesn't work, but India does, ironically. Because in mm -hmm. India, you read the Hindustan Times every morning, and we don't have anything like that in Europe. So an imperial system has to have a shared platform. Nation would have that more or less automatically because you presumably speak the same language in which you can also print books and distribute. So are we going to see a big splintering? Both. We will see that some kind of imperial order through technology is possible. And, and I, hopefully then the response to the Chinese that we don't want to have a little boy pharaoh ruling the world like you do with your Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping's dictatorship from 2014 is one of the biggest mistakes in human history. Why did he go for a North Korean model of ruling communism? Yeah, Probably I, because it was too weak to do anything else, right? Yeah, I, so, th I think I've been very about, unstable, very unstable over time. I've, I've been it's thinking about it, that that he. So why would you put yourself in a position like that if you look at what happened to Stalin, how he died, and and how how most dictators end up? This is not this is not a safe place to be, right? Because everybody wants to kill you. Yeah, you can't you can't even walk away. You can't say like I've I've had enough of this, right? I mean, I can just resign and go and do something else. These people cannot do that anymore. No, that's why Putin and Erdogan are not resigning in Russia and Turkey because they know where to go. And yeah. it's like they haven't learned from history that the dictator from Akhenaten all the way up to Hitler, Stalin, Mao, dies alone if he dies at all or is killed when he resigns. Right? Mm -hmm. You want to get rid of the dictator. You want to get rid of him. So the power struggles that are going on in China that we hardly even can look into at the moment makes that system very unstable. And so I'm not moralizing against those kind of systems. When I say that I like plurality, like you, I think a thriving culture is plural. I want to look into those systems like the Persian Empire and the US constitution today, and a system of Trinity and Christianity, and a system that has a triad, a minimum triad, to share power and split power. It's much more sustainable long term, and at the end of the day, can create can create the technologies, etc., that makes ecotopianism and cosmopolitanism possible. For me, the symbol symbols of this today is to create uh, eventually the fusion power reactor. Incredibly phallic. Hey, so is built around fire temples where you build a phallus that has a fire on top. Why do you put the fire on top of the Zoroastrian phallus, whereas the lingam in India is dead and stone cold? Well, it's probably it's because the Zoroastrians the understood the, the phallus is innovative and creative. The phallus is innovative and creative. You put a fire on top because it's ever changing. And, and if you just have a stone cold lingam, then it's just a dead phallus, isn't it? So I, I think that is important because the Nothing is more striking than building a fusion power reactor and hopefully then supply cheap, reliable electricity for the world forever, once you've done that. That is a typical utopian dream, it's equitopianism. And I think that just to set out that dream, even if sun power, or wind power, whatever, does the job on its way there, it doesn't matter, because this is, this is a typical example of an exodus, technological exodus. In parallel with that, I have great hopes of crypto and those technologies because any technology today that makes it easier for us to trust strangers is, oh, yes, please. Those are the technologies we need today. Anything that makes it easy for us to communicate with and trade with strangers, even if they hardly even speak our language, makes it easier for us to communicate peacefully, not kill each other. And then the third one is, where do you put sexuality on that map? Mm. And that is the timeless question. That's the third question that needs to be put out there. And to me, any religion that tries to 
shovel away sexuality somewhere, not deal with it. It's bound to come back and blow you in the face. So will violence, by the way, too, because it becomes inner violence or self-violence or whatever. But to not deal with those forces, with the pathos within us and around us, if you don't deal with those forces in the religion that doesn't have a full, complete under, adult understanding how you try to deal with those forces at least, but just try to sweep them away, is disqualified right away, right there. Because none of the other products are possible unless we deal with that first. I wonder if, like, like uh, you talk about a lot, a lot about the phallus and, and stuff, which seems like a masculine uh, idea, but it's not, right? It's like also the feminine is also phallic and... It seems to me that in in the tantric communities, there, there's a lot of powerful women. Uh, uh, they're not they're not just sexy, you know, sexy type of women, but you know, actually powerful women. They're not necessarily the, in the front or the main teachers. No, or, but you got you got the two but, realms called but, the womb realm and the diamond realm. But you so need to have you need to have and you need to yeah. have powerful women, uh, you know, and powerful men, uh, like, and you need to have this this dynamic between them for anything, like for for any kind of religion or to you know to work. Otherwise, it becomes too like as you say, boy pharaoh like, or 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 it becomes if it's all women, it becomes just it becomes just uh, you know. Um, Oh, I, I, one of the corners of the triad is feminine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You only need one corner for the feminine. Why? Because it's the one that checks the other two. So Supreme Court is feminine. President, Congress, masculine. Yeah. It's the masculine that needs to be split. It needs to be split because the masculine are going to lead, and then yeah. lead through body and mind. So that's a dynamic system. So you, yeah. So you separate that first. Body, mind separated first to serve the overall interest of the tribe. The women then are asymmetrical to the masculine because they're just gonna follow. And the matriarch is at the very end and you need to walk ahead of her, otherwise you're dead. That's how women pick at each other all the time to make sure they're all up and moving. That's how we move through history as well. Matriarch is the end. Okay, so in Christianity, they tried to make it Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Now that works in an esoteric fashion because the Holy Spirit is supposed to be God as congregation. So father and son are gone. And in the Jewish it's tradition, gone. it's it's, but it's the it didn't feminine. work. In, in so the pop version of Christianity became father, son, and mother because it makes a lot more sense. So Mother Mary stepped in and took the place of the Holy Spirit. So if you ask any sort of decent folk religion version of Christianity, the important thing though is for the Christian church is that well, well, Jung said that was people believe you there's no, there's no there's no mother daughter. There's only father son daughter. The Holy Spirit is the fem- but there's no mother daughter. There's no mother daughter. The mother and daughter are unified. What? Yeah, but like it's kind of like what we we're talking with about with Raven, and she was saying that the the the, the lineage, the mother lineage is, is lacking. Like the, the elder elder woman is lacking. Right? Yeah, but that's um, not lineage. She says lineage, yes, because she's used to vocabulary that comes from the masculine side. Lineage is important to men because men have lines, 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 lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and here's number forty-two. Any mm-hmm. damn cricket club in the world has these long lists of all the men to be presidents of the club. That's how men compare to each other. That's how they write huh. history. Women mm-hmm. don't do that. No, women only have matriarch here, older woman outside of the reproduction cycles. It's old enough for that. So she's the one who everybody trusts and need to have her to. These are the midwives and the brothel madams of the world. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And ahead of her are the younger girls, the daughters. And we cannot, we were not allowed to go into sexual ritual unless the matriarch gives her okay and says, yeah, it's okay now. Mm-hmm. Here are the girls, they're ready for you. Yeah. Give them the abundance. And they well, I was just thinking, Carl, Carl Jung said the triangle, like it's a pyramid, it's unstable because there's, there's, there's just father, son, and then ghost. Like what's the ghost, right? Where it should, where it should, where a quaternity would be like father, son, mother, daughter would be a no. A, Jung is wrong. Jung is wrong. Ser- he, be a no, Jung is wrong. Stable like is mono, tr- that, no, that no, would... no, no, no. Jung is wrong because his stability, the quaternity he's trying to create with the four corners, is a Platonist fantasy that just sticks. It's fixated. If you're going to have something that have moves, you go dialect- okay. dialectical. That's what you go. You call it sutra, tantra, dogshen, subject, object, project. You always do the three. Why? Because it moves and it comes back and it comes in new versions. So you do dialectics. You have three corners you play around with. And it, it's very easy then for humanity says that because men need to be split between mind and body specialty to then understand war and hunter, the difference between the two. It's men who need to understand that. Women don't need to understand that. And for them, it's just that I'm embodied. Women are embodied all the time. They just, it circulates around. And it's just like passions and logic and mythos and everything goes in and out. And they can afford that, and it's beautiful, and we love them for it, but that's actually the female mindset. That's why they write brilliant novels, you know, they're at least on a 
when it comes to writing novels and storytelling, because they walk in and out of the mist. They walk in and out of the mythos, the logos and path in such a smooth way. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. This is what men have to divide all the time. It's, it's men who have to divide the brain halves and just try to figure out how to write a story of the unity of the two. Mm-hmm. It's much more fluid to the female to the female mind in that sense. But it only needs the matriarch. That's why women don't worry about things like dictatorship or democracy. It's not a big concern for women. It's not a big concern. They worry about the trade with the men. They worry about what the matriarch has traded. What kind of abundance have the men delivered? Did they protect us? Did they provide for us, number one? And did they come in and impress us with an abundance? Because then we get hotter and juicier. Oh, then we can give more generosity back in return for the abundance. That is the yin and yang. It's a sexual ritual. But it comes at the end of the day. It is part of the reward system of the tribe. It's where new children are born, where hope for the future starts, and when next generation is born, they can, can take over the day you die, hopefully, go, you know, gladly give up and you die, and a new generation takes over. That it all points, it all points to sexuality, it all points to the sexual rich. It's absolutely fundamental. And because it didn't work with Christianity and Islam, and then it was fucked up the other way, we over sexualized. We haven't found. I'm not saying it's going to ever be harmonious or balanced, but if we're not honest about the role sexuality plays in our lives and that somehow here is where we have it, and if we don't do that, then yeah, then the lynch mobs come back to haunt us again. The envy, all of that shit comes back. But then it's not the beginning. My point is that Taoism makes the mistake or making the mystique of the mask and the feminine the starting point and then everything circulates around this complete constant misunderstanding between men and women. And that is somehow the universe operates. Taoism is, makes the same mistake in Christianity. It doesn't respond to all of the needs that religion actually needs to answer to. It's basically teaching for a certain interest. And that's why this tantric Taoism, for example, that makes sense, it's very sexual. But Taoism left a space for Confucianism in Chinese culture. Mm-hmm. This totalitarian religion, that is a state religion, and, you know, it's, 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 it's the vulgar version of the Prussian state. Because it it's didn't deal style. with society, it didn't deal with the social, which, which is kind of what you're pushing here in a way. Or... Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a oh. fiendishly hard game to get both state, market and reproduction under one roof. Maybe they shouldn't be, but at least you acknowledge they all need religion each. There has to be religion of the state rather than pretending the state is secular. There has to be religion of the market rather than pretending it can run itself smoothly, which it can't because then it causes havoc and exploits the earth, right? So, and the same thing goes to sexuality and reproduction. We cannot pretend we don't need spirituality or religion when it comes to these areas. We do. Clear. Yeah. And we, we tried yeah. to make them secular and failed. And that's why we're in apocalyptic times. But this seems so. This, these are also very creative times, right? I mean, like we're, we're discussing, you know, Taoism and Buddhism and Christianity, and then you know we're studying theology and what have you. So it seems that people are are incredibly busy with with uh, studying religion, with exploring religion, with redefining religion, turning it into med- using it for meditation, using it for contemplation, and so on. So so this seems to be an, an, a time of great creativity. And, and I have a little doubt that the, the great religions will now take new directions. They have to. They have to. Otherwise, they will, well, maybe even worse than become irrelevant. We might just just go extinct if the religions don't start working. Exactly. Hmm. Exactly. Hmm. Uh, so the call to arms is what I call ecotopianism and, and cosmopolitanism. Clearly, those are the two main cases. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. That's mm-hmm. with respect to sexuality. I think that so. Let's do a little thought experiment here, right? So suppose that you you know you, you do, due to some kind of magical uh, or technological te- technological innovation, everybody is happy with their sex life, right? Everybody's blatantly happy with with sexuality. They're still gonna find reasons to be jealous and envious, and they're still gonna kill each other. All of those reasons why the MBS is because sense, it, sexuality yeah. is not that central. That's that's kind of the point that I made with Cadell last time. If you if you would solve that, other stuff would come up. Well, it's not that, uh, but you're just talking about being happy in your sex life. That's that's one dimension. I you mean. never solve it. Let's just put it. Yeah, you never solve okay. it. Okay, no, this is about containment. It's not about solving a problem, and everybody has to have. Then you can just give people morphine, and they won't fuck each other because they're so high on the morphine. 
opiate opiate addicts don't care about sex because they care about the opium. So <laughs> that's how you kill it. But I would say containing is what priests do. And that's what we're concerned with here. Containment means that can we just prolong the peace a bit longer and see if that works without corrupting people completely? You know, can we can we can we let the steam out of the pressure cooker somehow so it won't explode in our faces? You know, can we lock out the atomic bombs so they won't explode in our faces? You know, that's essentially, you know, everyday priestly concerns is what I'm concerned with. Paradigmatics, membranics. You know, how do you how do you make this town function or this nation function? And where are the threats to it? Where is its naivety? Where are the blind spots of the system? Those are the things I'm interested in. I think philosophy should be very grounded in that sense. You should be concerned exactly with those things. Yeah, how do you prolong the peace? And I mean prolong the peace not in the way they all go and kill each other because that's no point. Internal violence is probably that bad. Rather like have a decent life, you know, prolong it. And, you know, the test is essentially, will women want to have children in this type of society we live in? And if they don't, then that is a failure on civilization. That is ultimately a female question that men like us have nothing to do with. Just like a perfect barred absolute is actually the abortion clinic, which no man should ever enter. No man should ever enter the abortion clinic. It is entirely an affair between the older woman and the younger woman. They have their mythical storytelling to figure out why an abortion can be defended and why it's a good choice compared to the alternatives. That's a women settled between themselves. It's a perfect example of the matriarch who left the reproduction cycle, talking to a woman who's in the middle of the reproduction cycle or what is a good decision for her. I have no opinion on that whatsoever. I prefer not to have one because I happen to be a man. And I'm glad I'm not. That's a barred absolute. I don't want to go inside it. That's a sign. You're a man. Don't go in there. Fine. Do you agree with that, Thomas? Um, yeah, to some extent. Um, I think that it's, it's extremely important to look at uh, sacrificial patterns. So in that sense, I'm a very deep Girardian. Um, making this a, com a complete triviality as, as often is done. I, I, I can, let me put it this way. Let me be very precise. Nowadays, if somebody says like, I'm against abortion, then, uh, you know, when you're uh, in the bourgeois, among the bourgeois elites, that's like saying that you're, you know, you're a fan of Hitler. You're not supposed to have that, that uh, opinion. I have absolutely no problem with people who are against abortion. It's not my, my answer. My answer to that was that my original statement was just to was that a general test of any given civilization that's been valid for the last 10,000 years and seems to be pretty universal is that a society that isn't welcoming of new children has somehow failed. I think that that's a good point. And it also makes men responsible for making sure that women live in a society where women together with men want to have more children. Okay. So, yeah. We have a, well, a big deficit agree, like, problem know. in certain cultures right now. We create an environment where children are no longer welcome. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. We we can then make we can, we can go towards extinction <laughs> by not having children at all. It, we're we're okay with that. We can't do that. But I think we should be aware of that in case we go down that route. Well, well, in that sense, we could say like, well, if if uh, abortion is a sign of a trivialization of of human life and of uh, of of the value of children, then you could well make a case against it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but the response yeah. to that would be that the response to that would be that forcing women to give birth to children that they don't want to give birth to is probably a, not a very attractive option. It's better to seduce them to actually want to have the children. Okay, in any case, mm -hmm. what I mean with that is that the bar absolute can be applied on many different things. And it's kind of nice in a very opinionated world as we live in today to have the bar absolute being applied to things like, do you really have an opinion about this? Are you really the expert on it or does it concern you at all? And then you say, no, actually it doesn't. Thank you for putting up the bar absolute for me. The same actually, thing with sacred thing spaces, was, right? Just same thing with thing sacred spaces. To, like. So I actually know more women than men that are against abortion. I don't really know any men that are, have strong opinions about it. I know quite a few women who have very strong opinions. Oh, about yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're perfectly allowed to have that. It's between the women to settle the scores in that case. It's matriarchy to me. 
Just mm-hmm. like I expect there are certain things that a battle dealt with among men and women should not naturally have much of an opinion about it and they don't have to. Uh, but it doesn't have to be just man and woman here, that division. It could be so many other divisions too. But the bard absolute is also, of course, what we call liminal space. And this is what Vajrayana Buddhism has, Zoroastrianism has. That's what I was kind of, that's why I asked Thomas the question actually, because I, because to me, you're, you're making categorical statements like this and it sound like, what about the liminal space? Like, what about a guy who's kind of like, very tuned into his woman and goes in the abortion clinic is probably a better, you know, in, in, in each, each case, it could be a different situation in general. I think I, I agree, but it, uh, yeah, anyway, but we can sit here and discuss whether men should have yeah. opinions on abortions or not. But my point is that <laughs> it's an example of something that could be like, I wouldn't want to kind of be described say, as a bard. Yeah, absolute. That's what I want right? to say. I say, I wouldn't it's want to categorically be- say, no, the men should not have an opinion about this. And women, should, you know, that sounds a bit too- uh, Are you terrified of Bard Absolute? What is your problem, Andrew? No, no, should everybody uh, have opinions about everything? Should every no, be, no, everything no. be transparent like, all the time? Yeah, no, yeah, like- yeah. I don't think everything should be transparent all the time. No, no, I, I think it's either, perfectly no. okay to lock well, that's the either door. Or, where you're, you're giving an it's either- It's perfectly okay to have a dinner party where you invite people you want to hang out with and not everybody's allowed to come in. It's perfectly okay for a nightclub to say, no, you're not welcome. You know, Definitely. is it, Barred absolutes are and must be everywhere. And this whole hysteria that surrounds flattening out the world and getting rid of the hierarchies, it's just the revenge of the ugly and the disgusting people to try to force themselves into places where they're not wanted, right? (laughs) At the end of the day, not all people are attractive enough for you to want to have sex with. And I'm sure the people who don't want to have sex with you now live with that. That's barred absolutes for you. I'm not saying everybody should have sex with everybody. That's not my point. (laughs) Well, Trans- if you go for the transparency, you're going to end up with those kind of ideas. Yeah, I, you yeah, got to put bar absolutes in there somewhere. Like you a, better know where you put them when you do. Like you better a, know why they're there and why they're chosen, so they're not thrown around randomly. Like, oh, I didn't say we should not have any limits or anything. Well, we, where are you going to have your limits then? Yeah, put them there then. Declare where they are and dare to say so, and have a reason why they're there. But the most important thing is this one: it is that there can be no experimentation if everything must be done within a civil order in a transparently open society where everybody gets to see and understand absolutely everything. So this is not only an issue about private and public. I think it's also an issue about the sacred space and the profane space. And that's gone. Mm-hmm. with the secularization yeah, of our world. Yeah, it's, that's, it's, that's, it's a big that's problem that the understanding of liminal space has disappeared. Yeah. And that is what I mean with the, re, with, with the return to the Bard Absolute, the most important yeah. aspect of the Bard Absolute. And the, when, when the Mr. Religions are adamant about the Bard Absolute is that the, here is a space where none of those rules outside apply any longer. We might even know, not have any rules, we don't know. But if you, you walk into the space, you sign into the fact at the outside, you walk into space, well, the rules are completely different. Because otherwise there will not be any experimentation, no creativity, and nothing will come out of it that makes the event possible. And also, of course, you will not live a full life before you die unless you've entered such spaces. Psychedelics is a perfect example of that. Mm. And, I, and I'm adamant that Psychedelics should not be taken by everybody, but it should be taken by people who are initiated and they should have intents and purposes why they do it. And it should be a ceremony that should also afterwards be integrated. And the typical example of entering a barred absolute when you're allowed to is that there's an intention prior to entering it. And there's certainly integration at the end of it before you walk back out in the sutric world or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a culture around barred absolutes is absolutely necessary because otherwise when we legalize drugs or decriminalize them, we'll have more opiate abusers than ever or whatever. I agree on that. It will be more problematic, but it, it doesn't get any better by just putting it into a pressure cooker and pretending it doesn't exist. What you need is the legalization. When legalization, properly speaking, is the religious law. It's like you take it out you say what it is, you realize what it's good for, you realize what it's bad for, you realize where you don't know whether it's good or bad, but can be experimented with. And that's of course the most advanced part of it. And then you start building barred absolutes for people who can enter these spaces and are willing to take the risks of walking into those spaces. We don't have a culture for that today. No, we, we don't have a tantric layer. No. We don't. That's the problem. Well, we gave it to the, you know, like it's uh, like a William Burroughs and William Blake, and it's like, you know, it's it's kind of like on the fringe, but it's not very well integrated. And now it's it's due to this transparency, this this kind of layer is is which actually worked. Uh, it makes everyone policemen, right? This mm-hmm. transparency, it's, it turns everybody into this policing behavior. 
Right. It depends on. Yeah. But what it does, though, is that the shamanoid becomes a role model for people who shouldn't even look to the shamanoid. And that's wow. what rock stars and things like that. After 1945, we talked about this before, the problem yeah. is that the idols became people who killed themselves when they were young. That's not a very good role model, is it? No, because they're shamanoids. So they should be idols for shamans, shamans and shamanoid people. But that's a small minority for the vast majority. Just like forcing everybody to become transsexual and deny their own gender was ridiculous because it's an androgynous project did nothing to oh, do with the rest of the population. this is fantastic i mean this is so important okay you, you need to know what the outside is and you need to know where the membrane is and yes the, and you need yes. to know what the inside is and and those are separate spaces and 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 one is obscure to the other oh, and, well, this uh, this obsession right. with removing all differences right this is yeah, again a pagan yeah. project this yeah. is only in liminal space in liminal space like in a carnival there is no distinction anymore between the, you know, the, the boss and the employee and or the king and the beggar. You know, in a carnival, all distinctions are suddenly removed. So that's liminal space. Mm -hmm. But now yes. people want to so people are are so people want to spread that kind of situation throughout society. And that will create that will be disastrous because a state of a, a global state of you know, on in, of of, uh, of lack of differentiation. That is the that is the eve of destruction. That's what happens before a society or a tribe destroys itself. Because you need to have these compartments of of of, uh, of differences. The, uh, if you have an interconnected space where everybody's competing with it, with each other, that means that every everybody becomes jealous and envious. So you get rivalry all over, and then you get war of all against all, and that is that is extremely destructive. It's called so Facebook these days. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what we're leaving it exactly. Fact, that's what's yeah, called. Has also has also uh, uh, warned about it, like uh, undifferentiation, like uh, no more differences between men and women, extreme androgyny. This is a sign of of a society in collapse. Yeah. So this is the point with the barred absolute. Yeah, you have liminal spaces like carnival. That's when it goes more public, and there's a softer version of it. There it. But there it that's when that. You can yeah. But if you're a regular guy or regular girl or whatever, and you're comfortable with that, and you do want to go into those realms and see what they're like, that's when you walk into the barred absolute. So you prepare yourself for it and say, yeah, why don't you go and immerse yourself in a space where none of the regular rules apply? And you go there with these shamans. And that's the space where you talk to the gods and you talk to the icons yeah. and do all kinds of things. And, yeah. and, and you rearrange your life. That's why people got up more androgyny and things like that. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and by having that inside the bard absolute, you give it a specific space where it's absolutely okay. You live it out and you try it on. And, and yeah, you did that. Wow, I did that. Just like if you take a psychedelic drug, you're not sober any longer. You're temporarily off in some kind of a psychosis hmm. or whatever. And you come back and you integrate it and you go back to everyday life. And this is the event in the sense that you're no longer the same person you were before. You're almost the same person but with a slight di di differentia mm -hmm. di differentiation. And that differentiation is what you wanted to get out of the barred absolute. Hmm. Yes, yeah. I, I agree. That's how to do it. It's breaking the frame of your, your everyday existence, which, which becomes reified and, and, and stale and... So you yeah, have to, that's why people yeah. even, that's why people do any kind of fe festival or festivity. That's why they, you know, like in you, in Mexico, all the men would dress like women one day of the year or something like that. It's like, you have to become your opposite or, and you have to, you have to, you know, and, and you have to break down all the structures and then, then you go back into your life refreshed. Right. But if your whole life becomes this sort of carnival, like, like uh, it actually gets more and more drab and more and more. Well, uh, then, then you 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 just re replaced one reification with another one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and car whole. carnival again as part of a reward system is then put at the center instead of being at the end of the line. Like you arrive here, yes, party, whatever. Next yeah. day you work again. But it, <laughs> that's same thing we put with sexuality. All I'm saying, at least I don't know about women. They might prefer the dogs and the shoes before they prefer the penis. But when it comes at least, man, men have to figure out a way how to go through the mind-body duality. And then go through the the war hunt duality, and then they're ready for the sexual the sexual ritual. That's the way I see it. Hmm. Hmm. I, I'd be happy to work on it. Anybody who listens to this conversation and takes part in it, and no, that's, guys, I mean that's worth. I'm glad to credit anybody who helps me develop the system better and improve on it. But I certainly think that if sexuality is only the third layer. And it's the end of the world system. It also makes sense where carnival comes into the calendar, for example. The same thing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the sort uh, of eternal hedonist party is just and the kick seeking tied to it. That is the absolute most absurd form of secular hedonism, 
And that's where our current society has arrived. Yeah. And the superego comes back to haunt us when that has happened and eternalizes the violence and it goes after us. And I think today, I don't think the difference between the superego message injunction or the ego message injunction today has been more different than it is now. Never been so before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's the it's a religious prohibition that that uh, fell away. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a kind of internalized gnosticism, that's what it is. It's been but forced on people. Yeah, if, us. If, and if we need to deal with that and untangle it, right? If the religious prohibition falls away, you cannot create liminal spaces anymore because you need the prohibitions to start with. That's why you need sutra and tantra. You cannot have tantra without sutra. Yeah. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. I think that's also why many people are turning back to Christianity and, and traditional values and stuff like that. It's because, well, well, if carnival is the permanent state of mind, then, then conservatism is the liminal space. Yeah, or, or it's, a, it's a zombie procession or the society just becomes that. And then so what else do you have, right? All you have is church or something, right? Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything to say on the popularity of religious. That can go either way. Usually, you know, these people go for simplicity and they go for simplicity and then they make mistakes because of it because the world turned out to be complex. But, you know, people are free to pick whatever religion they like, worship whatever they like as far as I'm concerned. But when it comes at least to deeper understanding sort of post-academic uh, uh, you know, neo-theological understanding of religion. I, I go for these richer traditions that have been around for much longer and that actually dealt with the things that were sort of more timeless. And that didn't I, I, I have this theory. No quick fixes, cannot, no shortcuts. Just... Really, I, I have this theory that you cannot really pick your religion. I, I, I mean, I used to do you know, workshops on devotion and stuff like that. And so I just told people, you know, make, you know, pick whatever religion you want. And then they, they'd start picking these exotic deities, you know, like uh, Hanuman and, uh, you know, with the uh, monkey face and this. Yeah, but that wasn't that. serious, Thomas. Come on. If you spend like me seven, eight years studying a religion and finally converting to it, you're dead serious about it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, well, it was the most important I, decision in my life, to be honest. Yes, really? Yes. Yes. I, yes I by far. Know. Yeah. And mm. it was the right one. It turned out afterwards. I made it an intuition. But with the knowledge I have now, that for me, that was the really right decision to do. Yeah. Well, I, I think, think any, anyone who entered a religion would yeah, probably still say that, you, right? you just get born into a religion. I don't think you can pick a religion. Yes, you I can. Believe in that. Yes, you can. You can convert. You can leave a religion and walk into another one. It's called that Exodus. Well, that's, that's your way of dealing with the religion that you were born in. No. So you're steeped no. in it. No, know. you can leave Egypt and so walk steep. to the promised land, and people do, and usually you they're the winners the, of history. The languages that we are speaking, they are they've been shaped by by No, you think you think well, you can curse this is this is like cursing people. No, you can't curse me on that one. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember very clearly rejecting Christianity. It's like I'm not gonna be a Christian. It was just clear. But I guess I guess my the cult my culture is Christian, but but that you you can make a clear if choice. If only it's I think like, I think Scandinavia like, today is at least just pagan again. It's just Christianity is gone. Christianity doesn't even know what it is any longer. It's just completely dead here. It's dead. I mean, even 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 the, even the Lutheran Church laughs at itself these days. It's no, it's, it's having it's con it's, it's having contests. So what gender does God have? You know, it's like <laughs> you can ask God if you believe in Him. You know, but nobody does because they don't believe He exists. So, or she or it is pathetic. It's gone pagan. It's all pagan now. That's the problem, but it's a good starting point. It's a crisis, it has to be dealt with. Paganism doesn't solve our problems in a cost in a world that requires cosmopolitanism and ecotopianism. It's the last thing we need. It's the thing that does not work at all. The uncontrolled Dionysian mob is the last thing humanity needs right now. Because then we get terror sex with atomic bombs within a generation and we're done. Mm -hmm. That's the threat to paganism. Yeah, we need the integration of Nietzsche and Girard. I, I think yes. that this liminal space idea is an excellent like uh, conclusion or something to our, our, you know, that like this is like that's it's that's called a, that's the Bard Absolute. The Andrew, Bard it's called the Bard Absolute. So, that's so I, I read this little text from the Cloud of Unknowing. Do you know this text, uh, Andrew? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I um, you know. My, I read Meister Eckhart all the time. I, I love, I just love reading him. I don't understand half but, of it. But. So this is 14th century uh, uh, Christian mysticism. And it, it's basically, they meditate on a Bart absolute, on, on a God that is never visible, always hidden. He's actually in the darkness. 
So this is a really great practice, actually, because instead of like looking for the clarity and feeling like, oh, really, God is there, you actually look for God in the in the absence, in the darkness. And that's a very interesting. Uh, this is a this is essentially a, this is a great Dzogchen text. Well, yeah, this is Dzogchen what I'm doing too, because the 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 the, the sun is in. You can't see it, right? It's invisible, right? So so it's like so that you, they call it dark illumination. The Jude, Jewish cattle last would love that the God of the Gation, right? Yeah, it's dark Atheos. illumination because because you need Atheos something in our philosophy. Yeah. You need something to reflect light to for for something to appear. So, so yeah, you are looking in the dark because because the, the the light has no reflection. That's that's the that's the absolute or the ultimate or or whatever that you know. Myself. Guys, we're two hours and fifty minutes into this conversation. <laughs> I love talking to you. Uh, you gave me a lot this day. Yeah, and also there are the coming in the box that actually are just reinforced. I believe they're even stronger now, but thanks a lot for you, but I love these yeah. conversations. Good hanging out again. Yeah. That yes, was cool. it is. That was yeah. great. Okay. Really, really good. Very, really good. Very intense at times and great conversation. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Next so, time with cigars and cognac. <laughs>